I had to say, it's a very difficult time to talk about this as a mathematician, I think. A very easy time to talk about it as a physicist. Uh, and that's because there's a, well, there are many differences, but one of them I realized fairly recently, and it's epiphany. I mean, most of my life trying to read physics papers and usually failing. <laughs> but, uh, uh, then, recently, I realized I was looking at the wrong way. So a physics paper is a wish list. <laughs> like a letter to Santa. <laughs> I would like the following things to be true for Christmas. In a good physics paper, not only are the wishes going to be interesting, but immediately we pointed out why some of the new wishes may seem at first to the untrained elf to be inconsistent with the previous wish list. The cat I'm asked, I want for this year might eat a goldfish I asked for last year. So then follows the long analysis explaining why the cat will not eat to the eat. The cat has been trained on dry food, for example. <laughs> and so at the end of it, what the cumulative result is a longer letter to Santa for the previous letters. And in mathematics, we have a slightly different approach. So we we'll drop the wish list and we we'll spend a great deal of time making sure the wish list really is consistent, no possible mistake there. The cat will never be in the same room as the goldfish we we'll install an electrified fence at the door, we'll electrify the fish tank. <laughs> Maybe that's where we help the physicists to tell us what not to do. Anyway. Anyway, and once we're done with that, forget about Sam. We put on the virtual reality goggles and pretend the toys have arrived. They've been produced by a homotopy co-limit of some infinity and hypercategory. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Moving. So, Unfortunately, in this story of TQFTs, even finite homotopy TQFTs, we're not quite at the stage of the complete wish list. So that's, that's a great difficulty, but it's very, we're very far from it. We have maybe a minimal wish list, which clearly is insufficient to tell us what we're going to get, and the maximal one is inconsistent, and a lot of the current work is trying to reconcile the two. So I'd like to explain that makes it a bit difficult to actually give an account of things because we know some things work or will work as soon as some of the wishes are executed. Uh, some others may be a bit more nebulous and there are of course always partial arguments but it's hard to connect it and even put in an account where you can say this is the theorem, this other thing is just a conjecture, the other thing is probably not true but we don't have an account example yet. But so I'll try to just give a, think of everything I'll say as a wish list, some pieces of which are at least can be proved to be consistent. All right, so what, what's the big wish here as far as TQFT goes? So first of all, we've learned for a long time since the Gobodis hypothesis that we should be looking at fully local topological field theories of Gobodis hypothesis. It gives an easy characterization of fully local TQFTs in terms of duality. I think David explained some of that yesterday. So namely, so if an n-dimensional TQFT is determined completely by what it assigns, so it's called the Zeta TQFT, is determined by what it assigns to a point, a plus point, which is an object in a symmetric monoidal n category. The object has a dual, u of minus left of v0 plus dual. And we ask that all the units and co-units of dualities and there are junctions going up all the way to the top have duals and ask for, for duals of uh, uh, unit of a junction, which is mapped from the unit to z of plus to times z of minus or the co-unit from going the other way. And of course, there are, so these are two, more, two pieces of data. It's a duality data. Then there is a condition, there are the two conditions. 
the one, one, one important lesson in higher categories or so on is whatever you say, whatever speech you're giving, at the end of the speech there should be conditions. <laughs> if it did not end with conditions, it didn't finish the story, yes? I sort of object to call the duality data. I mean, if, if the duality morphisms exist, they're unique up to unique. I mean... Um, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but uh, okay, yeah. You, I agree with that, I'm nothing, but... Uh, it's okay, I mean, it's... Oh, that, uh, they're unique up to isomorphisms, actually, but in order to write a condition, you have to pick... Yeah, you're right. They're unique up to isomorphisms. So, this, so the du existence of these is the condition on zero. Yeah, it's completely correct. So, let me lump it in one. The conditions are the composition map, so I'm going to write maybe one of them. So, maybe not write too much. So, x tensor x check tensor x. There's a map, uh, let's write it this way, from x to this. And I don't have to care too much where I put the dual in this case. At this stage, later we do. And this is, well, there's one map you can, well, actually there are two maps you can write. Let's write unit tensor 1x. And then let's write uh, uh, 1x tensor evaluation back to x. And you want this to be the identity, it's another diagram you can draw. So this is equal to identity. Plus other condition. And then when I, what I meant by you keep having duality is that these guys must now have dual. So we continue. And you and I have duals. And the duality data, sorry, to, don't know another word for it. The duality data have duals. What happens here, however, from here on, you're in a symmetric monoidal category, so it didn't matter where I put x check and x. Further down, you're going to be talking about maps between things. You're not in a symmetric monoidal category, so you have to be careful where duals are left or right. And so this is all the way to the top. But because left and right begin to matter, the correct statement is that you need framings on your manifolds. <coughs> One way to think about it, they give you directions of duality, it's not exactly right. And there's one point to mention here, is that the target usually, not always, but target is often an infinity n category, which means above n morphisms, there are only isomorphisms. Isos only above n. Now, once you get to a range where only isomorphisms, if you ask for these guys, the duality morphisms, to be iso, to exist, and that the isomorphisms then it follows that, in fact, the objects themselves are inverse to each other. And you can then descend down and show that actually everything you started with was invertible. So if you ask, he's taken one step too far. <coughs> you can go down, back. You show that 0 plus was invertible, or whatever said, morphis, whatever was invertible. Which once comes to the uninteresting case, but uh, this is actually a useful thing when proving that things are invertible. So useful tool for proving that. You show that you can construct duals all the way, including the place where things become invertible, and then you're done. You know, start with something. Invertible. And this actually has application. All right, so the first condition is we'd like some kind of target n categories with lots of objects with duals and keep track of morphism with duals. The second, maybe wish list, so, maybe this, so one was maybe lots of duals. The second, of course, is quantum field theory, so the target is linear, I won't even mention that. Try to keep the order straight. 
And once you're in this world, actually, if you wonder how you construct high categories, there is a old idea, I don't think I can assign a name to it, of raising category level. So let's keep it a bit vague. So the category level can be raised by considering algebra objects internal to a category. space from a one category, but algebras by modules and intertwiners from a two category. And in general, algebra objects in a linear category together with bimodular objects might, if you're a little bit lucky, form a one level higher category. Uh, you have to check some things. For example, you can compose by modules by tensoring. So you must find a way to show a tensor product exists. You can usually write a property for it, but then uh, you have some here is needed to execute that in the category to prove it exists. There's a paper by, I think, Claudia Scheinbauer and Theo Johnson Fried. So, which constructs, starting on vector spaces, for example, or for more general categories, higher categories by forming algebra objects and algebra objects and algebra objects and so forth. And the idea that this, this should be one of the God-given categories, I think, is quite old. I'm not sure to put, what name I would put on that, but executing it actually takes some work. Um, of course, when you build things this way, you're going to get some pretty gigantic things which probably won't have <coughs> a lot of duals. Um, and or, related to that, <coughs> we'd like to be able to gauge things. So if you have a finite group acting on some object, you want to be able to talk about the co-invariance and the invariance, and because you want things to stay in the world with duals, they had better agree. So given G acting on X, one talk about co-invariance, the invariance and an isomorphism from co-invariance to invariance. And G had better be finite, or else it's getting hopeless. And the characteristic of the ground field uh, because uh, the dual of a co-invariance will be invariance, and you want to have duals everywhere, so if you Produce the dual, produce some things using co-invariance. When dualizing and producing co-invariance, I will not be consistent unless the results agreed. That's what would happen. And so let's, uh, and that actually is, is a requirement. So let's, if I'm, by the way, if I'm too basic, please tell me, after, either now or after the lecture, I can skip a lot of things. So let's look at an example. Let's look at the category vector category of finite dimensional vector spaces. And let the group G act on it trivially. So G acts trivially. By the way, I think it's supposed to be, I was supposed to prepare homework. I didn't, so I'll be assigning it at all. So, so exercise, if you've never done this, take a class in H2 of BG with C star coefficient, which is also the central extension of G. And so it defines an action of G on the category of vector spaces. And compute the fixed point category. <coughs> All right, but if you do it by the book at first, the coinvariance 
They're defined by universal property of mapping out the invariance for mapping in, and the co-invariants come out to be obtained by a cross-product construction. So for every x in your category, you just add join lots of morphisms. And isos from x to gx, gx is the result of mapping g phi g, and the obvious coherent flow. And you're thinking for a moment, what this does, that's a category of finite dimensional free modules over the group ring. And that G is a finite dimensional <coughs> free modules of finite dimensional free modules over the group ring. Now the invariance. They're a bit different. They consist of the objects in the invariants are objects in the category together with a collection of isomorphisms from x to gx on each group element. And there's a coherence condition which I won't write down. And if you start with a trivial action, that means you get an automorphism of any category of a representation of G automorphism of X, so the result back G is a represent finite dimension representation. And there is indeed an obvious functor, obvious the It's some kind of a norm. If you start with the rank one vector space, you get a group algebra, and this becomes a regular representation. So it's a kind of summing over the group element. But it's not an equivalence unless you do something here, namely you take co kernels. So you need a minimum completion of the co kernels of uh, this type of potency. So that's the condition there. So this is one place where this other wish comes in, would like things to be idempotent complete at least. So this so far are pretty uncontroversial. Difficult to meet the requirements, but oh. there are a few more things. First of all, it's fun. I can't for my example. For my example. talk, and we will talk about boundary theories for TQFTs, and in fact, anything constructed from a gauge theory or a higher gauge theory, I'll talk about, has this property, so it would like theories to be generated by the boundary conditions. Conditional part of the Corbodis hypothesis tells us that actually. So uh, the theory itself is determined by what's assigned to a point. The boundary condition is also determined by what's assigned to a, a point, or, and that's going to be the interface between this theory and the trivial theory. So uh, a morphism from 1 to 0 plus, is that the direction usually? Yeah, I think so. I forgot if that's called the left or right boundary condition, with duality properties. So so z of plus should be determined by the dualizables in home inside the ambient category one of z of plus. Good question. Uh, yes. I, I don't know if 
I can phrase it in a mathematically precise way, but by boundary condition, is it just topological boundary condition? Yeah, topological. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's say topological. So what if the TQFT doesn't even exactly. admit so the topological? Exactly. That's coming next. Okay. And before, but before that's coming, the question next. I'm going to ask the seventh requirement, and this is one that will take a lot of explanation, is that you want the units in your uh, target <coughs> you can do all of the sphere as much as possible and what's above water. So it's So that's the most difficult condition to explain. I hope to motivate that. So I think this was proposed by Mike Hopkins. I don't think anybody had thought about it before. As a, as a, as a wish, again. And there's a lot of ongoing work trying to construct something meeting all, almost all these requirements. As Shuhan pointed out, we already have an inconsistency here. Because if you look at uh, with energy taken to drive theories, they fail condition six. Usually. So already that was too much to hope for. Sorry, I thought there's like supposed to be a relation between weight and Russian team and drive and like Crane Yetto theories in dimension four. Yeah, there is. But there's no what this condition says. The condition says that the wish rather than the wish is that the with respect to life theory should be generated by its topological boundary condition. That is not the case unless the theory was to derive zero type to begin with. Oh, right. That's what that's that's what that was that's something about all the way back. So about this invertibility. I understand the statement that if I have, for example, a useful tool for proving invertibility. I understand, for example, the statement that if I have a symmetric monoid and I assume that it has duals, then they are like inverse. So it should be this. Wait, what exactly are you saying here? That if, if you ask, so I said this, the object should have duals, then the duality morphism would have duals and so forth until you get to the top, but you must stop asking for that once you get in the region where you just have isomorphism, because then the duality morphism would be isomorphism, and then you would prove that those top level dualities were isomorphism, and then you could go down every step, and you end up proving that the original thing was invertible. So you're saying even if I have an n-dimensional TFT, I shouldn't ask for invertibility at dimension n. And that's right, yeah. But, and the positive way to spin that is that it gives you a tool for showing that something was invertible. If you can sh find some argument why the dual exists even there, that actually <coughs> can be used. I know one application of it, at least. Um, I have another naive question about number six. Number uh, six. So if you expect your theory to be generated by a full logical boundary condition, you expect that theory to also have the same property of being generated by some boundary condition. Which, which other theory? Uh, I guess, just to be concrete, if I have like a three-dimensional theory and my desire is that this should be generated by a boundary condition for a four-dimensional theory. Uh, no, it's a boundary condition for itself. So maybe um, that's a confusion. Okay. So the boundary condition for a theory is an interface between a trivial theory and your theory. That's in this. Here it translates to a, a map. Actually, maps can go either way because it's required to have adjoints. So, 
So this and you can and ask the question not easily ask the question next because this B is not a standalone theory, it lives on the boundary of a theory, so you can't ask for it itself to have boundaries because a boundary doesn't have boundaries. So you can ask for other things but not that. And this puts a bit of a spanner in the works because one way to like run, for example, this increase the category level but keep things small enough that we have a lot of these nice properties would be to keep asking that we have boundary condition. And in fact, anything built in this way would have enough boundary conditions. So the category of modules over an algebra, let's say finitely, uh, let's say the algebra is in fact generated by the modules. <laughs> so in other words, if you have if, if your category, if, if, your, if your TQFT is generated, comes from A modules, images that could happen, well, almost by definition is generated by its boundary condition, because the, all the modules are boundary conditioned for the theory, all sufficiently finite modules, all projective finite rank modules, actually. So in two dimensions, we have this experience that everything is nice, typically. And that's kind of what, and it, it helps a lot. That's where this switch came from, but I think it's pretty clear we have to abandon it. And it clashes with number five. You ask, why not abandon number five? Well, it turns out also clashes with number seven. Okay. <laughs> we have to abandon five and seven to stay with six. And, uh, all right, so, oh, it's a clock. Um, so what? I don't want to say too much about motivating number seven now, except uh, it's already, let's say one thing has already come up. This is what you need to really run electromagnetic duality for higher group points, not just for gauge theories. You need that. You need that, otherwise. Some qualities you'd like to write down will not actually exist. Yes? Um, do we already know that 5 and 7 don't flash? Uh, we know. OK, that's a good question. Um, well, not completely. There's very active, ongoing work now. I think Homer Schneider and collaborators have a proposed construction of something which seems to meet five and seven, and Theo Johnson Fried and David Reuter are also working on a model, but I don't think either of those projects is finished, so we don't know for certain that it don't clash yet until that's finished. One, we, we know the statement up to dimension four. I think up to dimension four needs to have been reconciled, I think. It's not written down yet. Right? I mean, it depends a lot on what you mean by all known examples, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, for some examples, you might sort of need the sort of more differential notion well, of the. There are so many four dimensional TQFTs, actually, that fully define the TQFTs. So, in fact, uh, the meta theorem, I first learned it from Theo Johnson Frank, but uh, he, he attributed to when and collaborators might be older. The meta theorem is that they're kind of all the H theories of like graph written twist, finite H theories. So in fact, that's true if you do something, if you do something to fix the units. Otherwise, it's an invertible theory you have to, that shouldn't be there. But yes, uh, number five is time dependent, obviously, social. Remember lectures on Angela Hitchens, sorry, I get a little tangents. No time ago, discussing the Penny B equation, I think Penny B6. And he said that in his work, Penny B said that this equation cannot be solved by any known functions. And then he added, you have to realize what a powerful statement that is, because in the 19th century, people knew a lot more functions than we know today. <laughs> And that's not the case. They did not know a lot more TQFT than we know today. So, <laughs> the 19th century. So. <laughs> so, 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 so
Duke's and Duel thing. Uh, if, if you imagined examples of a more derived flavor, would you still expect the same kind of uh, coffee groups? I, I don't know enough about that to even venture, I guess. Um, this is not the Anderson duel, right? It's the Pontryagin duel. Uh, I like to call it the Pontryagin duel, but... Uh, okay. Oops. based on this performance. <laughs> well, so next I'll kind of develop this gauging and calling it thing to introduce the final homotopy theories and what I know about them. For the examples. So I want to go eventually to describe topological symmetries at least those that come from finite homotopy types and finite groupoids. So the calculus is very executable then. I'd like to discuss something loosely called condensation in that setting. And electromagnetic duality comes in, at least trying to understand. understand the relation between groupoids and their quantization on one hand. And the last lecture, if I have time, I'll discuss uh, how you can just build easy models and related lattice models in general as you want using just electromagnetic duality, basically. All right, so. So let's pick up on gauge theories, and we'd like to gauge make a target for a category of for TQFTs from higher groupoids. And based on the little I know, so I can't talk much about it, I think that the good answer is currently in development by Claudia and Tashi. Um, so where did this come from? So I think in the, so an easy example of TQFT in any, any dimension is finite gauge theory. G. And for a manifold M, you send that to G bundles on M, so band G on M. And the invariant, so it's a top dimensional manifold. H theory G, so N dimension M. And the invariant is simply counting bundles, first instance. So it's, the invariant is simply sum over the components by not of band G map, let's say map from M. You count them by weight, weighting them by the automorphism group. So by one of mapping space P to the minus one order. And the variant, if you have a class, a twisted class in NC star, you can just divide it on the manifold and put. In the sum, you can add tau of dimension. And I will observe by Konsevich that you could actually make a completely consistent invariant, which satisfies the Atiyah Siegel axioms at least, if you have a higher groupoid. So, and Konsevich wrote a formula for that. Uh, and that was further developed by Quinn. It's not fully local, but enough to be proof of concept not fully local. 
And the formula for the invariance, so now Bg becomes x, a finite homotopy type. And you, for some purpose, you might also want the homotopy groups to end at n. I do not want your class to be a B, on BG instead of L. BG, of course, the source. You put it back to him, exactly. And then there's an obvious formula which counts the other homotopy groups, which so it becomes sum over product, product over i of uh, pi order of, say, pi i of maps from m to the x to the minus 1 to the i, I think that's right, and somewhere p in pi naught pi i of this at the point P. And again, you can put a, a star of apply to M of the evaluation. Very for closed manifolds. And it was, Konzevich uh, checked and satisfies the factorization of a TQFT. And based on that, it's actually not hard to guess how you would want to define the theory all the way to point. So fully local guess Now what is that formula? That's really a path integral over the space of maps, just a summation over a space of maps. So it's the categorical path integral So for example for MK you should get an um, n minus k minus 1 category as the answer. And there's an obvious guess from the path integral, which is the, let's say, space of sections over the mapping space, map from mk to x of the unit n minus k minus 1 category. I don't know. Vec n minus k minus 1 category. So this guy is 1, it's just a category vect. And then you're taking the category of local systems over the mapping space. If n is 2, it becomes a uh, two category. It's vect as a tensor category, if you like, or two categories. So this should be, if this could be defined, so okay if defined, so it should be okay if defined. You know, the formal reason, just like in the path integral, will satisfy cutting and gluing rules of uh, the factorization rules. Will be formal consequence of defining, well, not just for a single space, but defining this kind of global sections, or like cohomology with coefficients in a category, in a factorial way. So we follow from factorial construction. And that's the thing that Claudian is working on right now. Uh, and Tashi, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you say once again what this means? So facts n minus k is a deal. Yeah. So if if uh, well it depends on the number. So if if a number ends up being minus one, I would say a minus one category is a number. A zero category will be a vector space. So this is vec so from vec. You can form an obvious sequence of categories in the way I mentioned before. Take algebra objects and algebra objects and algebra oh, objects. Or you might say, let's take linear two categories of linear categories and three categories of linear two categories and so forth. You would say that. You would say the words. And if you have enough faith, you believe there's some procedure of actually constructing them. It's a lot less obvious that you can define a factor in global sections. So this is 
remember that sections over the example maybe. I'll do more examples. Vect are the same as invariant things in vect. And we make that vect sort of g. And that's rep g. Final dimension of rep sub g. That's an example. Sorry, so then, name, yeah. subscript, n minus k minus 1? So this is, is, is part of the wish. Uh, it's, it's uh, yes, I mean, so, some, something there can be defined. You can define something. For example, if you just take algebras and algebras and algebras, this is defined. Okay. What's not obvious is that you can integrate it over, even over a finite space. That's not obvious. It should satisfy some of these properties. It must satisfy punctuality properties because how do you prove factorization on these path integrals? Well, you put some boundaries there, and instead of instead of uh, doing an integral numerically, take an integral of value in space associated with the boundaries, and the factorization is simply from a fiber product description of a composed space. Yeah, it's a bigger fool. Category has to satisfy also that the invariants are the co-invariants and stuff, right? Uh, if it didn't. Then this would not be defined at EQFT. So let me, let, let me try to say something more, a little more precise in a second. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give a bit low on time. I'll give, I want to give three more examples later. But before we do that, so some, some time ago, we looked into the <coughs> paper by Free, Hopkins, Lurie. Help. It started out intended to do something else, but one of the things we felt was need is, is even if you define this completely mysterious, there's got to be a better way to say what kind of thing you get, and that I think has a path to a definition. We didn't actually finish the definition, and that is instead of using invariants, is to use coinvariants, cross products. So the cross product formula, iterated cross product formula. Placing the invariants that is the benefit of being has two benefits. First, it's somewhat more explicit, at least. And if you get really bored, you can compute what you get. And uh, second, there's something uh, you, you can more or less say that if there is any formula, that's got to be. So let me explain that in the five minutes left. So the, the quantization comes to them. So the fact that they're functors is still a wish, but I think now we are fixing that. So we see. So the finite number of the parts to M, I said M categories. So they build part of the wish build n plus one TQFTs. And it's going to be based on the observation, the space you're working with X. So first it's defined for space. So and then we'll apply to mapping spaces. So observation one, if X has finite homotopy. So it doesn't have space. So that is a finite. The finite finite so just to apply to mapping space enough to know what it is on finite homotopy times. And observation two is not an observation. Yeah, observation two. Uh, so so that implies enough to define. So observation two, X is built from obviously oh, phi naught, phi one, phi two. That's kind of my 
shut up time, but I'll just, I'll just write in, maybe I'll write the inductive rule and leave it a mystery, and then the afternoon I'll write the examples at the dimension four computing this. Then it gets to be so it's kind of an iterated cross product, and the way to think of it is uh, the way we think of it is we start at the top, which is going to be pi minus <coughs> pi would not matter, and then we start adding homotopy groups below. So move down. And every move down is going to be a cross product, the coin bearing construction. And because of that, it can be done reasonably explicitly until you get to sufficiently high dimension where you can't write things explicitly anymore. If you have that tends to happen when you have extension data. If you don't have extension data, you can still. <coughs> but here's the observation. So first, I guess Q minus one would have to be a number, and I've just defined it. But that's a bit special. Just the time. So Q0 of X is a vector space. And it's going to be defined in two ways that are obviously isomorphic. Here I'm going to claim it's just the span of a group of components of X. But it's also the space of locally constant functions on X. C, let's say, locally constant. And when X is finite, of course. When pi naught of X is finite, I disagree. OK. And now let's assume QM has been defined. QM Say, say QM of X minus 1 of X has been defined. <coughs> okay, I'm going to define QM of X for you. And that's going to be the first, just like here, the sum of our components in the final of X of QM of XP. So now XP we can assume is connected. And what is QM of XP of a connected string? I'm going to take QM minus 1 of the loop space of XP. I haven't lost information because XP was connected, so omega. Sorry, what is XP? XP is a piece component, and I've chosen, chosen a base point for this speed component, so P is in pi minus Okay, so what's wrong with that? It's a direct sum of guys, but these guys have their own category level. But now we notice that this guy inside is a group, has a multiplication. So this is in fact an algebra object. So the Qs land in algebras and algebras and algebras and algebras have just defined something of the correct category level. Algebra of the definition. And after in the afternoon, I'll spread it out up to up to m equals three, I guess. Which is four dimensional degree. Really? I recognize, of course, well known things. Um, so, okay, how much of it is rigorous? You would say not very much, because if you think it through, to really be able to execute this, you need to know some functoriality of the previous functor. So, Executing this requires some inductive proof that things are match the wish list all the time. But because of this inductive state, it's a 
it's an admissible problem, but uh, from what I understood, Claudia and Tachiar have a much better answer, which characterizes actually the, the target category which this lands by, by, by the first property, which is much clearer. It's a little closer to this. That, that is that, this part of the wish list is. It's not even published, I think, very soon. So I'll stop here. Can I ask you more about this example? So before you had map mk to x, and now you're just having the amount of bg. Why is it not? Well, I'm just taking, here I'm taking some the, 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 the underlying space to be b example of what I mean by gamma of something into, into a category. Oh, I see. Exactly. The example of that. So it's not, I mean, uh, but if you're staying with something like, uh, if you're at the, the almost top level, just where you're looking at categories, vector space, and complex numbers, all you'll end up seeing are one group points. So just, you vary, it'll be the automorphism group of the bundle, and then it'll be components, but it'll be determined by this answer. So gamma should be something like functors from BG. Gamma should be, you want to think of it as sections, or flat sections, maybe. Local sections. And that, that's exactly what it's going to come out to be. I didn't put it here, but you could put a twisting class, and then it would actually have a connection, and the flatness condition would appear with those conditions. So think of it as global sections. I think that's a, that's a good way to say it. But starting from at that end, I actually don't know how to define it and show it has good properties. So, Q minus 1 of x is that sum? Is a number, is yes. Is yeah. 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 so the is No, is x. Tau, tau is uh, a class in Hn of x. Did you write it, I guess? Sorry. So tau so is in... A diagram with twist in Hn of the target space, which is x with C star. And you have a map, if you have a map, that map pulls back the class, so you can integrate one of the Q also depends on tau on the other side. Qm, I haven't put a tau yet, but that's correct, yes. That was I, just, I just said, I just said, uh, when I homotopy types, but really the category we'll be looking at, I haven't defined it, I'll find homotopy types with diagram with cocycles. Okay. That's where Q so is different. There will be a dependence on tau or Q as well. Yes. Um, well, Q is Q. It will be a factor of this end. It will be a factor of a corresponding category, n category, and uh, category of things that are spaces and classes in which I think I'm class 1 on the space of C star. So can, can I ask a question then? Uh, I'm glad that you wrote this slide for me. I, I would have thought that uh, I mean, one strategy would be to show that a finite homotopy type is dualizable in this ca category of correspondences, and then to just fit that with the quantization functor. Is that the is, is that the idea? Uh, I don't think that was our idea, and I have to, I have to remember why we didn't think we didn't think that was working so well. I think because you kind of simultaneously have to prove functoriality of this Q. That's the thing. I mean, what have I done here? I've kind of cheated because I started taking the loop space, and I've assumed that no matter how you take the loop space, build a homotopy type out of that, Q will give the same answer. By the previous stage, Q wasn't defined quite like that. Q was defined in some specific way from the d double loop space. So there is something to check at each stage that you actually define a functor. But if you did, you'd be correct. I think that's right. okay, but even, so even if you didn't ask for a quantization functor, you could still ask for a TFT that is valued in finite homotopy types. 
Yeah, that is correct. If you show factoriality of this, then they will follow that it defines a TQFT by applying the mapping spaces just for formal properties. That, that should be trivial, right? Yeah. That it's dual. I find yeah. it, yeah. it should apply yes. that. Yeah. So the work is to show that this is coherently defined. So it's all about the quantization functor and not about the yeah. so that, that part disappears. Yeah. That, that part disappears. So, so you, what you're suggesting, actually, Rune Hauksen proved this. He has this paper on spans, and then also spans with local systems. Okay. He proved that any object is, is fully realizable. Okay, excellent. That's, that was my question. So that follows from that, if you want. Um, you need finite homotopy types if you only want n minus 1 dualizable? So for that, I mean, you don't need any finiteness conditions at all. The finiteness really is used in the quantization functor. I mean, there you can just do, like, I mean, that's spans. Like every every object in spans, no matter what homotopy type is, is, is self. Yeah, sure. With the local systems, you have to work a little bit. Better. I'm sure you do. Maybe that for the quantization, but not for the right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Could I just right. ask something? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm confused about the stupid thing with Q minus one. So shouldn't Q M of X only depend on the homotopy M type of X? Um, if that uh, M, then let me think if it's M or M plus M. That's correct. You have to be careful if you put a tau and there's a pi and plus one because it would kill it. That would be zero. Yes, aside from that, yes. So I thought that Q minus one of X would be. Q minus one is special. Okay. Q minus one is special. And actually, that's somewhat interesting. When you want to build Q all the way to the top, and Q minus one you need because it defines, of course, then the morphisms between Q zeros oh, I see. as like matrix coefficients. And to get Q minus one to be functorial, there is no choice. You're, you're forced to write that formula. Okay. You can easily show that fiber product. Okay. This is just how you run the induction. Okay. Yeah. There is a question in the chat. <coughs> uh, Item seven in your wish list concerned units in the target M category. Mm -hmm. If you could elaborate on what the wish is. Yes, I will elaborate, but not. Okay. No, no, that's a, yes. that's, a, that's an important point, I think. So it has to be explained. It's a lot less obvious than the others. If one would think of like, can one think of a similar construction not with spec, but for example, like chain complexes, and then like Q0 already would depend on the full homotopy type, is it true? Q0, it's, um, Q0 would probably be, I really have trouble defining Q0. Uh, it's, Q0 is a vector space, and that if you have the information, the homotopy type is that, you need to go to Q1 at least, I think the question was to try and do the same, but to replace VEC by DG VEC? Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a, a lot of it can be done, but the, the example that's been worked slightly away detail is a straight topology, the two dimensional case. And, and uh, with the rational homotopy, but, but there are more choices than you think at first once you get into homotopy rules. For example, tensor products and co-tensor products may not, are not quite dual to each other once you get to infinite things. And because of that, there will be more than one way to construct the quantization. And there are close relations between them, but they're not isomorphic. So a string topology already, there are two constructions, and one of them kind of loses pi, most of pi 1, completes pi 1, the other one remembers it. So there's, there's some choices to be made. You certainly have to give up the top the numerical invariance, but even before that, there are some choices to be made. I don't know a treatment in arbitrary dimension, actually. Just a two-dimensional case. <laughs> Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to ask this question, um, but it seems like I'm supposed to be imagining that I have like uh, n vector bundles over this manifold of, uh, that's the mapping space. Um, and the picture that I'm kind of used to is having like some sort of structure on the manifold and then a map from 
the manifold to like, this structure that's compatible with the classical map for the tangent bundle? Like if I want like a tangent? tangent yes, what, what I've said to this point doesn't require any manifolds. You can take any of the any finite CW complex and define some kind of generalized TQFT on CW complexes. Uh, it, the manifold begins to matter when you start actually sideline. Begins to matter when you have a twisting class which you need to know to integrate. Um, I guess the question is like, is there an expectation that like these categorified vector bundles should have like classifying spaces or something? Or like it, is this just not really compatible with that previous picture? Well, so we say classifying space of vector bundles, we, we remember the automorphism, right? The U or something like that. So if you just remember the units, in vertical things, surely you will, that's equivalent to knowing a space. Right? Constantine, I think the question is, I mean, the, the, the guiding example is where X equals BG for a discrete group. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so in that case, very much it's a classifying space, not for something like vector bundles that can vary smoothly, but that are locally constant. Um, and since he's working with homotopy types, it's, everything is sort of lo locally constant. Yeah. Written locally constant, gamma, gamma locally, locally constant. Gamma means in this setting. So path in, the path in X will induce sort of isomorphisms between fibers and then kinds of examples. Have lunch. <laughs> All right. So let's continue. So after the lecture, I got a few questions, which are yeah. maybe one little bit more precise. Not not everything that says a wish or imprecise. And some things can be made precise very easily using general nonsense. So for example, I had written. K category, symmetric monoids of those. So you can think of C as an algebra many, many times over because it's commutative. That is actually, that can be precisely defined. What needs work is to show it has the properties you want. So for any category, for any category, so for any category C, you can build a topological group, we call it maybe GL uh, out of C maybe. Um, little, little automorphism group of C, or of maybe little automorphism group of C, where you start with, uh, at the base, you start with autofunctors, then you have an uh, Automorphists of the identity. So, no. the functors. Automorphism. Then automorphism of the identity functor. And that means automorphism of each object compatible with the, all the maps in the category. And automorphism of the identity of the identity functor, and you can keep going. You model by isomorphism everywhere. These are the homotopy groups of a topological group. And 
say that you build a flat system of category of fiber C over X simply means that, uh, so just, just as in topology with local system, but you can describe local system by the monodromy representation, so the flat bundle of C's with uh, fiber, flat bundle of C's over X, sorry. Same thing as homomorphisms of omega x, which is a base point to the automorphism group of C, which is a higher group. So you can convert this to an actual topological group, you can convert this to an actual topological group, and you can convert this to a strict group homomorphism. And then a homology and cohomology of x with coefficients can be defined as a co-invariant or the invariance. And they define, described by universal property, what you get may or may not live in the world you thought. So that's when the check's coming. But there is there's no question about what this means once you have defined the structure correctly from the action of the category. If you want to compute that, there'd be another way to compute it. Try to compute that's dual to the one I'm describing now. Because the x itself has homotopy groups that say phi and the phi. That's phi won't matter here. You know. N minus k first on n minus k minus one, n minus k minus two. And so forth going down. So you can find for x, keep all the lower homotopy groups, x less than n minus k, and you have a shifting version, sigma n minus k of phi n minus k as a fiber. So when integrating over x, you can do it in stages. First integrate over this guy to end up in a local system on the base. Then integrate over next homotopy group. So as you go up here, so toward the top, the category level of, of where you are decreases, but the commutativity level increases. So here, you'll be looking at invariance of pi and minus k acting on a vector space. Then you can get invariants in the pi minus k minus 1 in the category, and so forth. So there'll be, there'll be a computational method that was dual to the one I listed quickly at the end of the last lecture that I'll describe. But you're faced with exactly the same problem. You're sure how this integration, this invariance, land you in a place where you, the wishes about your category are satisfied. So it's not too difficult. But let me write the promised example. Right? So I promised we can compute the computing QM of X in examples. So M equals zero, I think I had written. Just to emphasize, the, the bundle that you consider here is like the bundle induced by the twists of the theory. Uh, or did you start with? This, you could think of it as a monodromy representation, right? If you had, if C was a vector space, you'd be representing pi 1 onto that vector space. You get the flat button. So you got homomorphism of V. No, no, sorry, I'm sorry. There's no tau. Sorry, I didn't hear the word tau. I'm slow. No, I didn't put a tau yet. I, uh, Wait. Um, oh, that's oh, the oh. case that the flat bundle is trivial, right? Or am I confused? Mm -hmm. Sections of the trivial flat bundle would be untwisted. You, of course, you're correct. So when I wrote this, you are correct. Without any twisting, this would be the trivial flat bundle. That is correct, yes. So, and then, of course, the representation is trivial. Nevertheless, you're still supposed to take co-invariants or invariants. And I give something not trivial. Thank you. Yes, you're right. I jump directly to a general local system. There is a map from B to the N minus K C cross to vect N minus K. So, given by the lines or something. So it's. There is, but let, let, let me not try to get the ends in order because it's no, very confusing. So I'll we'll get to the group I where the twisting tau lives. I mean, in, in a second, motivate. Uh, there was a question about motivating a seventh wish on the list. So I'll get to that and then we'll, we'll understand that. Uh, all right, so let me call zero I had written. So Q0 of x was a vector space. And it was a vector space of globally constant functions. So it's direct sum of over P pi naught of x of C times the point P, if you like, so it's C 
spanned by prime order of x freely or also functions on the set prime order of x. Isomorphic. M equals 1. So q1 of x must be, well, it's sum over the prime order of x of what? Well, I'm saying q0 of omega x, omega in the component p of x. And that is a sum over p in prime order of x. What we know what this is, it's simply functions spanned by uh, pi naught of x is here, but functions spanned pi naught of omega x now is a direct sum over pi naught of x of c of pi 1 of x in the component of p. And now we invoke, hey, this, is the, this was a group. So there's a ring structure here. And it's, of course, a group ring of pi 1. So it's a direct sum over pi naught of x of the group ring of pi 1. If you prefer to, or if you want to complete and the complete, that becomes just direct sum over pi naught of x of the categories of representation of pi 1. Okay. M equals 2, so Q2 of x is going to be, well, we start with Q1 of omega x, so it's always the sum. We have to sum over components before we do this. Direct sum always the sum of the components p by naught of x of q1 of omega p of x, and that is stop here. That is so it's sum over by naught of x of. Uh, um, sum over, what should we call the next line, p prime, p prime in pi 1 of xp of the group ring, if you like, rep of pi 2 of x, and then that's a sum of categories at this point, but we need something of a two-categorical level, an example being a two-category, cat two tensor category, an algebra object in categories, and now we have to invoke the fact that omega p is a group to write this as a, a this as a tensor category. So how is that a tensor category? Well, the multiplication as before is a convolution on pi one, and then there's the multiplication on this category. Let's be a bit careful with that. That's a confusion place. So. It's always safe to write sum over p in pi naught of x. And then I'm going to write a tensor category, rep of pi 2 of x, group ring of pi 1 of x. So it's a group ring of pi 1 with coefficients that take tensor category. And what's a tensor category? Well, it's actually a representation of. It's not the obvious, ten this other tensor product, but that's not the obvious one. Because the group multiplication is a multiplication omega x and becomes a convolution of pi 2. So you need the pro convolution product of representations. The product induced by convolution of pi 2. It only exists because pi 2 is commutative. It's faster than the other one. And what it comes out to be, so it's direct sum of algebra of tensor categories in pi naught of x of representations are equivalent to vector bundles on the dual group on vector bundles on pi 2 of x dual. What did I mean dual? And the pointwise tensor product that we have here. So it's vector of pi 2 of x dual, and this is slightly wrong because I, I was assuming here that pi 1 doesn't act on pi 2. If you want to generalize, you have to write pi 1 of x. But 
cross product category, pi 1 of x acting on this. That's slightly, uh, slightly misleading way to write it. This doesn't necessarily commute to pi 1. And there's room for a k. <coughs> And that acts, pi 2 acts is in the units here, and it acts a digraph within twist of this group of this uh, pi 1 rate category. Okay, I'll write Q4. I want to try to explain it because I always get confused when I do. No, Q3, no Q3. What does this have to do with the diagraph within twist? Well, so a diagraph within twist, normally you start with a, just with a group, the pi 1, no pi 2, and you can take a class in H3 with C star coefficients. C star being the units where you take the coefficients. So pi 2 sits as units in there, and the class in H3 is a generalized diagraph within twist. You can call it generalized, takes values in the units in the, cat in the tensor category of coefficients. You could add the regular diagraph and twist on top of that coming from a class in uh, H3 of B pi on say C star coefficients, if you wanted. Uh, <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, I mean, it would be in H upper 2 of X with C cross coefficients, yeah, right? The diagraph and twist will be in H upper 3 of X. It's a three dimensional. Oh, yeah, M, sorry. Oh, M is shifted, two, yeah. The two yeah, categories yeah. generates a three yes. dimensional. Yes. Yeah, I'm Sorry, I think that was, uh, no, clear, yeah. that was the convention I chose, you could yeah, argue about it. Uh, on the M equal one example, you, I suppose I have an, a, just an algebra, and then I end up with a category. Should I think of this as Kerubi completion? Yeah, yes, that's the uh, co-limit co projector completion, or co-limit co completion, yes. I think the, uh, it depends slightly, I mean, how careful you are, which I'm not. Do you really want that at every next le level of category to take algebra objects in the previous category, or do you want to take their category of modules? But completion would, would force you to equate them, basically. Mm -hmm. so. um, are the expressions cleaner or messier in general if I want to use like some push groups instead of cross modules? Um, From, from simplicial groups. Uh, I don't know that experts in higher categories here know more than I do. That, that one of the difficulties that one always deals with in higher categories, they don't fit nice in the simplicial framework. You need to go to multi simplicial framework to spell things out. So that's why I don't immediately see a shortcut if you're over something simplicial, but working in the higher categories. But maybe there is one. So if somebody volunteers to answer this question, that'd be great. Eh? All right, write very quickly what happens with H in Q3 in four dimensions, because I want to illustrate something later when we get to some Q3 of X. It's going to be, I may not write the whole chain, it's going to be the direct sum as before of things by not of x, and it's going to be over a cross product of pi 1 of x and that component, acting on a braided fusion category built from pi 1 and pi 3. So let me write in the words first. <coughs> classes in, for an abelian group A, a classes in H4 of B of a group A with coefficients of A prime are in bijection with quadratic maps. 
from A to A prime. And you may know the construction that this also defines gradings on the convolution category on the category <coughs> of uh, uh, like the right of B2 I3 Daniels uh, door source over by two or linearized linearized their braidings on on the category and that's why I usually make the mistake of um, <coughs> The group ring of by two with coefficients, <coughs> excuse me, in the symmetric tensor category built from by three. So C of by three coefficients in by two. And this is now as an uh, this is at the level of uh, tensor classic. It's a convolution category of what? Of a category of B2 by 3 torsions. B, sorry, no B2. So the category, a nonlinear version, just has the objects by 2 with the usual addition. But now you add automorphism. So automorphism of each object is by 3. Wait, but everything is C-linearized, right? Not yet. This is not C-linearized. But these quadratic maps classify exactly this. <coughs> so this is the answer to what is classified. And now you C-linearize. And this becomes a braid tensor category, but with automorphisms of the identity, not, not just automorphism of automorphism, not just C, but the group ring of pi 3. Okay, and so pi 3 is in the units. And now it becomes a linearized braid tensor category. Okay, so you have a braided tensor category with pi too many simple objects. Pi too many simple objects. And automorphism is in the automorphism of every object. Yeah, that's the dimension. The, the, braiding, the braiding, I think, sees that pi 3, interacts with that pi 3 possibly, and then all of it is crossed with pi 1 acting by automorphism, twisted by its own k invariant. So you can see why continuing in this form is not promising, but it can be done, especially if, if some of the k invariants vanish or some of the groups vanish, you can actually write it out. There can be still, there can be still like a more complicated k invariant between the pi one and the pi three as well. So that's correct. So pi one, the k invariant will capture the fact that pi one acts by automorphism of this. So maybe this would be the k. Maybe k four. There will be a k invariant combining these two. <coughs> that's that's the pi one acts by. Yeah. Interesting automorphism of an extension of, of this braided tensor category, or actually of, of this groupoid. And that tells you how the groupoid exists. If you try to start writing it out in terms of the individual k invariants, you don't know how many of you were at my son's lecture last week where he wrote some spin bodice, G equivariant spin bodice group, and uh, he gave a description given by Morgan and Brumfin, I think, in terms of a, I think, a layer of four co-chains. The first one was the <coughs> side, and the others were defined as trivializing co-cycles constructed from the previous step. So that's the sort of thing that begins to go in here. It's usually not something you want to write down explicitly. That's what homotopy theory is about. Sorry? In the examples you gave so far, there's no homotopy type. Of X. Yes. Is there hope that we can detect something else on the homotopy type with the TQFT as well? Is there hope that what? We de can detect something else on the homotopy type? No, this, this, this theory is uh, built from finite homotopy types. We only detect the homotopy type. Once you put the twist in, you can detect something about tangent bundle. Well, actually, something weaker than that. Once you put the twist things, you need to know how to integrate. And the structure you get is not quite a tangent bundle. You get something called a speed back normal vibration. It allows you to integrate. Uh, once we take the next step and talk about electromagnetic duality, the condition of duality requires Poincare duality on the space. 
without that, electromagnetic duality is not duality. It's not duality. So at that point, you're getting very close to manifolds, at least to binary duality space. But uh, there is no reasonable hope of detecting more than homotopy type and characteristic classes of manifolds using these theories. So there. If your goal is to get to manifold invariants, these are not interesting. They're interesting only as an exercise, a practice garden for higher categories. All right, so with like a proof of concept, you can actually continue and it becomes more difficult to write. Uh, now, as we mentioned before, we can add twists. We can add So for m equals 0, you get a line bundle. As an h1, you get a line bundle over x, and you take a q0 of x tau on other flat sections with other sections. And that continues m equals 1. You get a bundle of categories, so flat bundle of categories. So for example, if x is pg, then I think the exercise before was that gamma over BG is this way with that this is by tau, but those are the projective representations with tau, which is sort of definition. And this continues, I think. Uh, anything I want to do? Uh, no, H3 I mentioned, so M equals 2 and 3. Tau contributes to die cut with twist. And uh, there are some observations here you can make. Some observations. So, when, so for QM, if pi uh, what's the dimension? n plus 1. So the last pi n plus 1 of x is not 0 and is represented <coughs> by non trivially by a diagram with a twist. So tau pi n plus 1, the c star, is not 0, then qm is 0. going to take at the end or at the beginning <coughs> we'll do it. invariance under a group acting non trivially on C and the answer is going to be zero. So it kind of tells you there's no need to have a pi n plus one when doing this quantization. I mean you can throw it if you had it and you put a twist on it it actually created zero. Uh, also for QM of X <coughs> uh, you can trade off the next lowest homotopy group for a diagraph with twist. By M of X for a sum of diagraphs. For a sum of theories. Over a dual group by MX dual with the tautological diagraph. Pi m of x shifted, of course, in its dimension that sits inside x, which maps into x less than m if thrown away by m. You can replace that with a direct sum of theories, which has just x direct sum over, let's say, pi in pi m check, which is x, and chi as a digraphic twist, so chi. X less than M. Where does chi come from? Well, the way this guy is attached, so pi M is attached 
attached by a gain value in Km plus 1 in Hm plus 1 of x less than m with coefficients in pi m. And applying chi, you get now a decaf with interest. So I should write here chi composed of k m plus 1. And composed of chi composed with chi That's one that's less than n C star. And those of you who've seen this before will recognize it as a simple case of electromagnetic duality. I've essentially traded the pi m for a pi zero based on the dual group at the price of adding some twist. So in this construction, that's always breaking up the top, where is it, my three braidings, the top category into a sum of linear things, sum of linear things. Um, okay, questions before the next topic. So now I'm going to develop this idea of moving some homotopy groups to the bottom. And to use electromagnetic duality and I'll justify, I think, what I said about the units, what we want about units. I'll do some examples. Any questions before they I'm to make sense of obs the first observation. So tau there. If tau oh, right, so I tau mean is, tau is in H one or no? Tau is in no it was in H M plus one. So ta tau from pi m plus n to C star defines why does it define something? Uh, yeah. Tau restricts, so, 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 so tau is from x to what's sigma m plus 1 c star, shift this degree. So tau restricts to, restricted to sigma m plus 1 by m plus 1. Maps, of course, this guy to c star, to sigma m plus 1 c star. And that's just a homomorphism, a character of pi plus. Oh, okay. so the restriction of tau, the top homotopy group, if that, if that is not zero, if that's a linear character, then the result is zero, and that's a bit like, uh, like saying that if we integrate e to the, yeah, uh, the x or something like that, it gets zero for the line. So the uh, line bundle has a section if and only if it's trivial or something. Or? Uh, it says that if, right, what does it say, that if you, if you have a non-trivial one-dimensional representation of the group pi m and you ask what are the invariant vectors in sum, I am the only one zero. I mean, all the way down, it is a statement about the Fourier transform of p to the i k x. It's not zero, it gets In the path integral, if you have a linear term in the Lagrange, right, else if you have to something linear, one of the variables, it means that restricts you to the locus where that field is equal to zero. But here, I've chosen a non-zero mode. There was a linear term, I've chosen a non-zero mode. So this is going to get zero. I would, I would have to, I would be forced to restrict to tau equals zero to see something. The first observation. That's uh... the second one is a bit less obvious, but um, we'll follow from the middle. There are no questions. A good time to raise the board.
Okay, so let's start with a random thing. So let me just say so. Slogan: Electro. I don't know what that is. Electromagnetic duality. Duality is a categorified Fourier transform. Dimensional DQFT Let's take it We need to do that or take it based on a billion group S of X and a billion group A to be defined the group A check or the group. And these are finite, finite everywhere. And the Fourier transform is an isomorphism with the functions on A. on A and A check have a natural isomorphism between them, the spaces of states. Okay. Let's do two dimensions. And again A and A check. And this time I'll take X and A and X check. And I have to write now to be more consistent, sigma x check is a check again. So what's the category here? Generally by category. So vect fixed by a is the same as rep of a. If you quantize this as a category, you get so this is this is q1 of x. Q1, let me write this on the right. Q1 of sigma x check is, uh, of course, a direct sum, uh, direct sum over uh, what alpha in a check, a copy of a, supported alpha. When you write sigma, do you mean b? Sigma, I mean b. So it's a shift, think of it as dimension shift, but yeah, that would be. And it's also B in topology. So everything is stable. And I always forget if it's bracket one or bracket minus one in the. Well, these are a billion groups, so at this point there's nothing to check. No say, really. Uh, to clarify, is the dual group like the group of characters with? Convolution is the multiplication, or so a check is an abelian group. It's a naturally the dual abelian group. That's all I'm saying, right? It's an abelian group, so it's it's trivial. Okay. It's just touch. Can you speak up? No, I, yeah, I, I didn't quite get the question. I confess, but maybe. Oh, you can. I, I guess maybe I was just unclear about what a dual group is. So is it just category? Oh, what the Dupont dragon dual group? So it's home of. There's nothing fancy here, form of A into C star. So categories, there's, there's no tensor structure on them yet, but we see that these are equivalent in the obvious way, because these are the simple objects, the alphas, the points of H. All right. One more time. Q1 of X, Q2 of X, so 3D. I'm going to take x to be b a, and I guess you want to call it sigma 2 of x check. So, kind of I think of 
The reason I use different notation to answer the question is I think of it as topological space, whereas I want to think of it as an algebraic shifting operation. See, is now B A check. So the dualizing replacing in degree with pi minus one, then moving that up twice. <coughs> Now it is q2 of x. I think we've done this, and we found, if I remember correctly, the co vector bundles on A with convolution. I think tensor category. Right. And this is, so q2 of, of sigma 2x check is vector bundles on A check with convolution. And that is also representation of A with its natural tensor structure. And the proposition, we quote many people here, the usual suspect, like Ostrick, Nikšić, and so on. These categories <coughs> are not equivalent. Morita equivalent. By means of a very specific object, so by means of, of the A, let's say of the vect A slash vect A check by module category. So vect A acts on vect with a trivial action. Vect A check acts on vect the trivial action, but the two together can be made to act in an interesting way of vect because A cross A check has the Heisenberg extension. So this generalizes in two directions. They're very fun generalization to non-abelian groups on this side. Uh, I don't know if I want to have time for that, so maybe we'll discuss it later. I want to generalize in dimension. In the abelian case, a reasonably easy exercise. There's the products we need to do. In the non-abelian case, you have to think of it, if I recall. Last time I did it. Let's move the general dimension. You just have a million groups and we're shifting them in different dimensions. So we're looking at dimension D. So we're going to be looking at. Uh, QD minus 1, organization. And the theorem is that Q sub D minus 1 of sigma P of A is equivalent to QD minus 1 of sigma D minus P minus 1 of A check. So the dimensions of the shifts add up to D minus 1. Uh, very algebraic computations like this, but you can actually illustrate that. So the equivalent, how do we get an equivalence? We need to understand morphisms, need morphisms. Right after all, I have to construct morphisms with these guys. And the morphisms come from realizing Q as a functor on the correspondence category okay. uh, this is the category I guess now of spaces finite homotopy so the objects here 
finite homotopy spaces of H spaces. Morphisms of home from X to Y are going to be spaces, also finite homotopy spaces, mapping to X and to Y. And the composition, oops, that X, Y, W. Composition is the homotopy fiber product. Z cross over Y over Z. This is a zigzag with a up and down. The homotopy conclusion. Which means you convert one of the maps or both if you want to a fiber bundle and you form the fiber product. And now, Homes between homes, so two morphisms. You can guess what they are. You have X and Y, then you have a Z and a Z prime, now between the same guys. Oh. Well, a morphism between them would be a W mapping to Z and a Z prime so that the maps to X and Y commute. So this commute. And you can continue indefinitely, but we're going to stop at D. And the wishful theorem, let's say wishful. This one's not going to be the PQFTs, the finite forms of the PQFTs. Applying the appropriate Q's give you a functor, so Q, the Q's, the functors, gives, give a functor, give a, sorry, a functor from, I didn't give it a name, correspondence, correspondence of dimension D to, let's say, algebra of algebra, D minus one times, I guess. Of C. If you take D equals 2, algebra of C is already a 2 category. Yeah. So is algebra, 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 is it the same as E and algebras? Yeah. It's not. So in the first algebra, you get algebras, uh, bottom of this, algebras, bimodal good point. Modules and intertwiners. That's two morphisms. And now the second algebra structure on this is defined using bimodules. So if we an algebra, so the side, so it's an important point, otherwise this wouldn't work. Uh, a side, so the second algebra structure in algebra A. Okay. Is given by a trimodule or a A tensor A on the right A module and a unit, the unit goes from I guess C to A. C to A is the unit. Multiplication plus associativity isomorphism. <coughs> Which being how you tensoring plus a condition and the unit condition the second algebra structure, but I can actually make it more palatable by saying it's equivalent to a colimit preserving. Tensor structure in the category of, I guess, left A modules. On a. So the second algebra structure on A is, means converting the category of modules to a tensor category. And you could continue defining it that way. Two category of module categories for that. Tensor category could be converted to a tensor two category. Well, no, you'll do cutting, and there will be a third algebra structure on A. For example, a tensor 
category would be the category of modules for any two algebra. So I, I no, guess an example. But most of these guys cannot be, in fact, you can only get enets based on connectivity of the source space. Ah, okay. And the more connectivity you have at the source, the more enets you get, and you can be more economical with the data. All right. So, we have to believe that. But based on that, I can write the category by Fourier transform now as something concrete, it's no longer an abstract. The wishful theorem is, of course, of now and then Tashel writing up, so it's not science fiction. Oh. Actually, I raised too quickly because I had one more comment to put on co-cycle. The rest of the space isn't. It's pretty essential now. or supplement, complement for these things. And they're still right now in the homology of properties in C star and that will change soon. So if you have x and tau, I guess x and sigma, and y and tau, homology classes, what is amorphous? It's z and sigma tau rho, I don't know, zeta. Rho. Yeah, rho is an n minus 1 to chain with d rho is, uh, I guess, pi x star, pi y star, tau minus pi x star c. Realization of a difference co cycle. It's not a cohomology class in general. It could be if this is the cohomology. And then this is the usual kind of thing we think of a space with a diagraph with it. And now the equivalence is generated from. Sigma P of A plus sigma Q, whatever it was, of A check, mapping by the projection. Sigma D minus P minus A of A check. And with a cocycle chi in H D minus 1, with coefficients in C star, from the dual natural pairs. You can think of that as a Fourier kernel for the convolution, Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. 
So in proving this, you actually you can do it by using something I mentioned earlier today about keeping going up in duels, and eventually you get to the place where you hit the Heisenberg group and its unique representation, which is invertible, and then you know everything else below is invertible too. So that's what is ends up being an isomorphism. Okay, so that was strictly a billion case, and now I'd like to do that for spaces. Spaces. And let me give you the summary instead of going to do it step by step. So, problem. Given a space x for an homotopy d type x. Can you, I didn't quite understand how the chi appears in this span. So you, you, you put it there. there the P. So the top thing is not just a product or? The top thing is a space, so the D my uh, erase that you So what is a morphism? It's a pair consisting of a space and a coat chain, which trivializes the difference between cycles. Ah, okay, thank you. The cycles are zero in this case. So you can put a cosine, any cycle you want. And I'm saying it's an obvious one, if you, that if you do that, it's an isomorphism. So let me just give you a very quickly run down what's going to happen. There is no dual. That would have to be a linear dual. <coughs> We'd like to imitate that, so we'd want to dualize the homotopy groups. and flip their order and shift. In general, there's no such construction, but there is a special class of space that are linear enough that you can do it. So for infinite loop spaces, as they're called, from a space of stable maps from X to this mysterious group of units I C star. And then, I'll just say it very quickly, I'll pick up next time if we, for details we need. So then, This story works exactly the same. No? Q, what was it? Let's take D minus 1 of x is equivalent to Q of D minus 1 of sigma, the suspension by D minus 1 of x check, induced by the space x plus sigma D minus 1 of x check, and the class chi a bilinear class from x cross sigma d minus 1 of x check. Landing, however, not in cohomology, but into sigma d minus 1 of i c star. Or, if you want to get rid of the suspensions, you can. x cross x check. So, the dualizing object is this spectrum i c star, which has, I may have mentioned, pi 0 i c star, pi minus 1 z mod 2, by minus two, and then one, two, and then four. The first step. Uh, I might explain, or might may not get to it, explain what, what these things mean in terms of known things, like super vector space and clipper algebra. So there's one, and two, very sketchy statement. For any space, Space X. There's a slight difference, even an odd dimension. So, in dimension D is N, okay. and flip the top half. So, 
of x uh, greater or equal than n, the homotopy groups up to n, and sitting in x maps to the, keep the homotopy group below n. We can flip that to x less than n cross sigma, what is that going to be, d minus 1 of x, what is great, equal to n, dualized with a co-cycle built from the k invariant extension class linking these two. Extension. Extension class. Hope I got the numbers right. There's a different index. Yes. I guess if I could, if I write to n minus one, I think I got it right. And then I don't have to write any more. I think I got it. Let's hope I got it. So that's the. That's where I stopped today. So on Thursday, I want to do an example of it, just come up in physics with a, just with a two group. Where we can replace the two group, the four dimensions, with just an extension, a single group, but an extension. And giving us the equivalent theory. So this actually seems to come up in examples. And then I'll move on to the discussion of uh, a pause electromagnetic duality after for, for, for one lecture after that because we don't need right away and I'll return the last lecture when we'll discuss a little bit about the uh, easing model in those terms. So next time again first I'll do an example of this for a two group at least, more examples if there's demand and then I can move to symmetries and defects before we return to the Easing construction, which will do symmetries, defects, and electromagnetic duality. So that's it. Sorry, you were doing questions, right? X greater equal n, is that already a spectrum? Or? Uh, that's, that's right. Uh, you still have to be a little careful with pi n. I didn't have to go to pi n requires a little bit. So x greater than n would definitely be a spectrum, yes. The version of the Freudenthal suspension theorem that if you go high enough, everything becomes stable. That's why I can please. Sorry, I didn't. Actually, I don't understand what the statement is here in two. You can always cut up yes. any space, project to the base containing homotopy groups up to a level, and the fiber will have contained the other homotopy groups. Yeah, and what's the and consequence? Construct this space, and it gives an equivalent. I didn't write a conclusion. You might. <laughs> Actually, yes. I think, uh, and, and so the Q, what was that? D minus 1 of X is equivalent to Q D minus 1 of the product of this x less than n cross sigma D minus 1 of x, comma, in this cycle, yes. So you can get rid of the upper half of the homotopy groups without changing the theory. And one particular consequence is if you hope that TQFT determine the underlying space X, it does not because of this move. Right. It kind of determines once you build this thing which has all the homotopy groups below N, that is kind of unique. Yes? Um, I don't understand. Why do we need for the statement um, that Q is a functor of and we shouldn't be like, we only want to show that something is an equivalent, shouldn't it be like, uh, level of one or two categories? 
Uh, we need to construct it in some way. So then I just construct one more piece. So in some sense, you can say, yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so you, you can check. But when you actually want to prove that, you yeah. have to keep going up in category level until you reach the place where you can say what happens. Which, well, maybe you can say right away, but the place where you know for sure is like a fully transformed one with the Heisenberg group, right? Okay. And what, what happens? Why should this? I mean, we, we saw examples, but why is this span, the linearization of the span in equivalence? And why, why, why does this zero mode? Why I, I stated that. I didn't prove it for you. Okay. It's just to state that shows a generalization of a Fourier transform of the Heisenberg group and the three dimensional EM duality. That's what I did. I haven't written a proof of what, why that induces an equivalence. Okay, so it induces an equivalent in this example, and therefore, and in, some, in the examples you showed us, and then we expect that it induces a proof in general. Well, I stated it in general, yes. That's so correct. But this is, I think, the most general statement you can make for a space. For a spectrum, you can keep it nicer. I think the question was whether that is already an equivalent in the span category, right? Uh, no, it's it's not, I think, but why is it? I, I don't see why it should be a linear, the linearization should be an equivalent. Uh, you're asking me to prove it for you? I don't think I'm going to do it now. So it has to be a little clever at some point. It goes up to the top. Okay. It shows that, that at the stage where I didn't expect it was an isomorphism, therefore all the adjoints going down are isomorphism. That's how it runs. That's the only proof I know it. Well, what will happen if you try to write it, if I remember correctly? You compose, so if it's an isomorphism, what's the inverse? You know, it's a dual. You compose with a dual both directions and try to prove it's an equivalence. And I think always when you keep doing that, one side is obvious and the other is never obvious. So you have to check, is that really an equivalence? So you compose again with the adjoint. And that's how you move up. Okay. By the time you get to the top, you get to the Heisenberg group or the Fourier transform, however you want to, want to go. And then, hey, that's an isomorphism there. And then that's, that's roughly how it And that's the only argument I know. Mm -hmm. Maybe more. I think you'd like to write something like uh, uh, n dot over Q D of uh, D minus one of sigma P of A of the fiber counter. What this fiber counter is Q D minus one. Of sigma p minus p minus one. Yeah, you can write that, but I, I don't know. don't have a good sense how to how to check that at a high category level directly. It's meant to be true. Exactly right. It took when these three. Okay. Three exactly right. I'm going more slowly than I plan to, but I don't have the feeling I should be speeding up unless, unless I get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just coffee downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I probably want to start a very quick recap because So a quick recap, was abelian, what I would call abelian, strictly abelian, the M duality. Put the word strictly here. Look 
că e is a final abelian group. E ce e dual group. And if you take the shifted group, it is a P of A, and you form the quantization Q T minus 1, so D dimension T Q F T of sigma P of A. That's an algebra object in a D minus 1 category, an iterated algebra object, that's an algebra object. And that, the theorem is that uh, it's Morita equivalent to the quantization, the same world, of course, of sigma d minus 1 minus p based on a check. And it's a Morita bimodule. So we need to bimodule. Built from the product of the two, from the, the twisting, from sigma b a cross sigma d minus b minus 1 h check and the canonical twisting tau in h uh, d of the product of coefficients in system. Right? And as a homotopical version of that, and I very quickly went through that and jumped to spaces, so maybe it will help a bit if I explain in the abelian case. There's a partial dualization you can always do. Or any subgroup, if you have a prime, a subgroup of a with quotient a, a second, the, this is described by an extension class in x1 of a with coefficients in a check, and that is also a class in x1 of a plus a check, actually, uh, with coefficients in c star, and you can describe by a bi character. The second thing I said is, is the bi character A cross A check to sigma and C star. And you can dualize just the subgroup A prime, so sigma P of A, the quantization of sigma P of A, becomes equivalent the quantization of uh, sigma p of a second, so the quotient stays in place. Then the fiber gets dualized, so sigma d minus p minus 1 of a prime check. But now we have to have a twisting to a cycle, which is exactly what is given by e. By linear twisting homology class. So this, this extension class corresponds to that extension? The extension class corresponds to a class in HD, my, uh, HD, sorry, HD of sigma P of a second times sigma D minus P of a prime check, yes. That by character becomes a cohomology class. I think I've just confused how, I mean, this extension between A prime and A double prime gives me a class in X A prime. Uh, a, a, sorry, A, this is A prime, I'm oh, sorry, X prime A second, I don't stupid, the, the other way around, exactly. Prime, the pairs A, it's a bilinear pairing of A second times A prime check into C star 55. Okay, and then, yeah, so also the bi character, sense. I get yeah. a prime and a double prime. The bi character, I forgot the prime, say, for it. A prime times a second, no. a, a second contravariant in a second, covariant in a prime check. Thank you, Dr. And I said that so there are two steps which I went through rather quickly. So one, homotopies. So you go from linear things to Stable homotopy thing, so the stable homotopy. And two, the unstable version. 
And so you wonder why we would do that. Well, you don't have to do that if you want to stay just with spaces which really are topological abelian groups, strictly topological abelian groups. And then your calculus can happen in the derived category of abelian groups. But then you're giving up on a lot of interesting spaces, including on diagraph with co twists of gauge theories. You can include those we're about to see in that calculus. To include those, you have to move to homotopical world where homology actually lives. And that move will also require us for the statement to replace C star with that slightly bizarre, more complicated thing, uh, IC star. So, in stable homotopy, the statement is that uh, if x, the analog of an abelian group, is an infinite loop space, and that means the addition is homotopy commutative coherently to all orders, so, and because, for a lack of a better name, I'll call it an infinity group. So infinity group. That's the actual name. And then the, the dual group is uh, uh, stable maps, so infinity maps, let's, let's use infinity maps. Homotopy commutative to all order, infinity maps, homomorphous from x to this IC star. So dual x check. And then the duality applies exactly as written, but the twisting go cycle will have to land in I see star. So that's a little theory in there. All right, and for the unstable version, we're going to, which I wrote last time, you do the same, this partial duality. You dualize the part you can do. The upper half of a space is sufficiently stable, almost stable enough, that you can apply this duality. So, so one is this, and two for x. For d is either 2n or 2n minus 1. Uh, and given a space x, x, and the homotopy group of x go between pi 0 and pi minus 1. So we have pi 0 and pi, pi d minus 1, sorry. Uh, you can f break up x or write x as an extension uh, as the part that's greater than equal to n, all of x, and projecting on the part that has a power of u less than n. And this is almost stable. There could be a problem with pi n coming from a quadratic class. And I don't want to discuss that, but I just want to flag that exists. So possible problem with my uh, class. We are non-linear, so non-linear classes. And I think it only happens when n is even. even because when n is odd, the square is 2 torsion, mod 2 the square is actually linear. Square is a linear modulo 2. So, there's a if you start with x, you're producing uh, infinite loop spaces x greater or equal to n. The upper half, yes, except for the quadratic thing and the quadratic, yes. So those two now are infinite loop spaces, so we can run one. You can dualize the top half because of that, exactly. And there's the quadratic problem which has to be addressed, that's uh, related to some work we did with then and now here, which is that these quadratic things, quadratic, non-degenerate quadratic function define invertible theories. And one, I didn't write on the wish list, but one, one thing you need to do is to declare, to kill those, to declare those are trivial. And the theorem is that it can be done consistently. When you do that consistently, you're going to be adding some TQFTs which are not of final homotopy type and which don't have uh, topological boundary condition. But that's one good way to handle the middle dimensional problem. Um, so then, I'm, let me finish on the right hand side, 
you can flip, flip uh, x greater or equal than n to a space just homotopy groups only up below n to get uh, x less than n plus x greater or equal than n check with a co-cycle with a co-cycle <coughs> and uh, the co-cycle ends up being linear on the dual part this it's built from the extension class again that stacks x greater than n on top of x less than n and kind of that's why it becomes linear when you dualize it it's non-linear in general on the on the bottom part and that's been the reason why electromagnetic duality doesn't work on spaces but only after the quantization if the co-cycle happened to be bilinear and this also happened to be an infinite loop space duality would just be flipping the factors but the co-cycle which contains a so-called k invariance of x is non-linear on this half if you want a world of spaces where you can do the duality you would have to allow co-cycles that are non-linear on that half and going back to spaces that would mean that your k invariance would have to be polylinear, multilinear and there, I don't know how to execute that in finite homotopy theory but in differential grade algebra, in rational homotopy theory you can actually do that you have to enhance the L infinity structure to polyvector fields and you get something which you could call as a not quite commutative space but the n space I don't think anybody has done that by the way but, but, uh, and that category will have electromagnetic duality um, but all right let me do an example of that I promise a concrete example that I've seen that come up um, so let's do n equals 4 theory in the two group uh, which has a uh, equal x and phi 2 is of course the billion phi 1 is g and has a k invariant in h um, uh, sorry h 2 3 3 of bg equals in a and the diagram put in twist in h 4 so all of x of course which is this tau so n is actually d and n n is the switch from n to d at some point well, I mean you said that d is 2n D, no, D is 2n, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, here, here D equals 4. Uh, Apologies. D, yeah, D equals 4, M equals 2. D equals... D minus 1 equals 4. <laughs> <laughs> the dimension of the theory will be 4. Uh, no, 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 dimension of the theory yeah. is D. D is the dimension of the theory, sorry. Yeah. So Q, it's Q D minus 1 because it's a D minus 1 algebra or category. Okay. All right, and uh, I need to look at that. And from that, I'm going to claim so modular the quadratic obstruction you can produce just a group, produce a, an extension of G by H N and with an extension class E, of course in H, uh, H2 of BG with coefficients in H check, and a twisting class tau prime in H4 of BG tilde with coefficients in C star, and you can only go one way. You cannot always go back. You cannot produce all the data on the right side. Let me indicate where the, you can read off the data and leave it as an exercise which is coherence, because it's of course the, the coherence condition between tau and kappa, because tau lives on x, not on a and g separately. And similarly, it's a coherence condition for tau and tau prime and e. And if you were to write a spectral sequence, actually, that may be a good thing to project. Let's see if I can do that. Um, Sorry, I'm, the, this side didn't contain a tower, did it? Uh, I did not put it, but you could put it. I did not explicitly list it. Oh, this you could put it, and tau would have to be, except for the quadratic bit, it would have to be linear on this bit. That's why it doesn't, it doesn't go okay, so you have to be even more careful. Um, 
you know, you're running into the same exact same obstruction. You can always trade a tau for a homotopy degree. Well, you can always yes, you can always trade a tau for a homotopy group near the just below the top. Actually, so there's no substantial difference. Somehow, putting a tau is like putting some like a root of unity at the just below the top and extracting a Fourier mode in the theory of computation. This equivalent computation. But uh, let's share screen. Yes. Okay. This takes a while. Sorry. Zero. Example, you could have chosen X to be to have homotopy groups in pi three and pi four as well. Uh, pi three, pi four, no. no, you shouldn't put it there. Pi three can be flipped to pi zero. That's how it works. Okay, yeah, so pi four can mess. Pi four can right. mess things up. If if if, if tau detects pi, there's a pi four and tau detects the end is zero. Okay. So you don't want to actually have a pi four basically. Pi four will do it as a pi minus one. And pi minus one, as we all know, is an obstruction, an obstruction of the space existing, more or less. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, so you don't want to have a pi Right, so here are the terms. Here's the quadratic part of the Dijkroff-Vinko cycle. I said, let's assume it's zero, else we have to do some a little maneuver to get rid of it. And then the next term, this is degree four. The degree four is here. The next term is H2 of PG with coefficients in H check. What is your extension term? And then there's another residual part in H4 from the base, which will contribute to the co-cycle tau prime. And now if you ask, uh, probably have to get rid of this. If you ask what, what data do you need, the E and tau prime, well, the E I already uh, uh, explained it, and we have to find a tau prime in H4 of G tilde of C star, uh, which, uh, better. And I'll leave it as an exercise. When, when both classes are present, there is a bit of work to do. You have to show it on the fiber product. You can find the, for the fiber, you can find the class tau prime from the data given, which pulls back, of course, to this fiber product, where you just add the A, B A check in the fiber, X cross uh, over B G or B G tilde, pulls back in such a way that a different co-cycle can be trivialized. And that will then give you the duality. And the interesting thing, if you go through the exercise, you cannot go back. For a general tau prime, you would not be able to find a tau always. You cannot flip things back up. That is. Will you make your notes available? Yeah, they're not nice enough. Ah. <laughs> so can right. you, you agree? <laughs> I like them. <laughs> I don't know. At least these two pages. <laughs> these are nice. These are not nice. I can go faster if I go through that, but yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't work. If I go much faster, time slows down, so I have more time. But... <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my relativity, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is the example I want to give. We'll return a bit to duality when we discuss boundary conditions, because I have to explain what happens with boundary conditions under duality. That's quite interesting. But now, let's introduce the last ingredient. We'll need to talk about defects. These are representations of this uh, d minus 1 algebra. And you have an algebra object in the category. The obvious place to look for representations of modules in the same category. Uh, and why do we need representations? Well, several reasons. One is that it does the idempotent completion that we like to have. And you see from the description. And uh, another is it's a representations that are so-called quantum labels for topological defects. It's not the quantization itself. It's not the quantized group point, not that algebra, but a module for the algebra. So let's describe them for maybe. Is it better if I do this? Yeah. Yeah. Better. Okay. Good. Uh, so there are several ways to say them. Very formal definition is look at local system of objects of the category living over a group point x. And you can imagine there's a formal way to define that for objects in any n category. And 
the same theorem about local systems being determined by the monodromy will say that they're the same as representation of the group of omega x on objects of that uh, uh, of the category of this d algebras and the representations of something of, the, of a group acting on the, on the category as as fixed points of a trivial action on the category. If you allow the twisting, a diagram with twisting, then you would be making a slight non-trivial action, like a, twisted by a character, and be looking then at projective representations in the same category. So that would be a variant. And passing from this algebra, this category mod of modules, is a form of idempotent completion. Next question. Uh, in physics, when we have projective representations, uh, those are typically associated to anomalies. Uh, you you can think of a diagram with really those like as an anomaly, if you yes. think, right? It's an anomaly to having a non projective representation, the obstruction of having a non projective representation. It's going to be a different category of represent representation that you get, which is not compatible with the untwisted ones. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, of course, the difficulty, of course, you can set up this formal thing. The difficulty is to identify a sufficiently nice class of representation that we can execute the machinery of uh, TQFT, like with all the dualities. And the commutative case are not instructive. And I like to claim that, uh, oh, let's scroll too fast. I like to claim that this dual in the appropriately shifted dimension has an interpretation just like in the usual Pontryagin duality, the moduli space of strictly commutative representations uh, of sigma, right. So the space is sigma p of a, shifted group, so the group is sigma p minus one of a, and the moduli space of strictly commutative represent representation on, on the category, suitably shifted category vect, uh, the d minus two category. So I think it's, uh, Sigma d minus 3 of vector, uh, sigma d minus 2, I guess, of the algebra C has to be. Um, uh, I wonder if that would have been a. No, because no, d is uh, 2, 0 category, that's right. The sigma minus 1 of vector will be a 0 category. So d equals 3 should give a 1 category, and vector is a 1 category. So you shift vector up categorically. You can st start formal. You can just look at a category as a single object, single morphism, single blah, 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 until you get to the correct dimension. You put the category back and then do some kind of idempotent completion like that to produce the linearization. So then the claim is, if that was correct, that uh, if, uh, if P is meaningful, so let's take it less than D minus 1, there should be a unique representation with automorphism group exactly sigma d minus p minus 2 of h x. When p is exactly d minus 1, you get to 0, then there's a set of representations. That's a claim. Right? Well, so how do you describe such a thing, the universal representation, so to speak? It's actually easy, because you have the bi-character we've met before between these two shifted groups, landing a sigma d minus 1 of c star. And you think of it as a central extension of this group, by the automorphism of the identity on your category, and that gives you an action on, the, on, that, on that category. So it, it turns sigma d minus 1 vect into a module. That's the analog of, you might have remember, we're looking at a cross a check, acting just on the category vect. And the action is defined by the Heisenberg extension. And this, this is what led to 3D electromagnetic wire. And just by playing a homological algebra game, you can replicate this. All right. But now we run into a problem that there are actually lots of actions of this group, shifted version of Phi, onto this shifted copy of effect up to isomorphism. We know, we like to say, they're classified exactly by the uh, Co-cycles in H D minus one. So in H D you uh, you identify if like anomalies or twists. In H D minus one you identify the one-dimensional representations of this group. And this group is certainly not zero, whereas before we said it's a unique representation. It's a mismatch between what I'm telling you, trying to tell you here, and what you know from 
twist things in DQFT is how twist things work. There seems to be a lot more. But the mismatch comes from mixed metaphor. Because a strictly abelian world involves chain complexes, and we're talking about a derived category of abelian groups, and the moduli space of representation will have to be computed there as our home. It's called strictly linear, strictly commutative, our home. Huh? That's not C star, that would be C, sorry. C shifted. Oh, no, it's C star, instead of abelian groups. It's correct, it's written amazingly enough. I don't trust my notes, but it is right. Mm -hmm. And if you compute this at home, it's exactly a shifted copy of the group, dual group A of A. Cohomology comes instead from the homotopical world. So that's computing the world where it's commutativity, but by homotopy commutativity to all orders. And the correct dualizing object is this spectrum, which has C star in degree zero and the homotopy groups of the stable homotopy groups of spheres below. And the linear representation of for our home is exactly what I had written before, a stable maps. All right, so the correct thing to say that's analogous to the Pondragon duality statement is that this shifted dual of A is a moduli space of one dimensional representations of the shifted group shift of A onto the appropriate shift of C, um, but not just one dimensional, but also strictly commutative. And that's a condition we now, now have to impose, okay, meaning E infinity. And so there are some caution once you start moving up. So for it is not true at all one dimensional representation of this shifted, even if the starting group is strictly a bit. Not true that all of them are infinity, are genuine characters. And it's also not true further up that every representation in general splits into a sum of one dimensionals. That's for abelian groups. None of these things are true. I have an example. Um, uh, actually, it's somewhat interesting. I used B2 of A, so sigma 2 of A. And uh, possible, so it's a five dimensional theory you build from B2 of M. You can think of it as a braided tensor two category. The braiding happens to be trivial, not putting any data. And the possible one dimensional representation homo uh, in the homotopical world are classified by H4. And A was, I did not say, A is Zemo2. <laughs> Otherwise, it's obvious nonsense. So A is Zemo2. So there are four of them, and they correspond to four braided tensor categories based on uh, the group A and the quadratic form. There quadratic form. are four quadratic forms on Z mod 2, and they lead to four braided tensor categories. So you're using braided tensor categories with objects A and no the objects are A, and the automorphisms now you can take them to be C star. That's all you're putting for now. Automorphism is a delooping of C star. Uh, the, the objects are A, and their automorphism is, sorry, the endomorphism is of each object is C. And the fact that it's a braided thing moves it up two steps. The quadratic form gives you the braid. Yeah, just a semi-simple semi category, sorry, a semi-simple category based on the objects of A with a tensor structure coming from multiplication, which is symmetric, a priori, but when you put the quadratic form, you actually modify it to a braid. That's that part of, uh, yeah. It's always going to be true. If you have, a, if you have an abelian group and a quadratic form into C star, you can build a braid tensor category yeah. this way. And each of these is going to be a twisted, uh, let's say, a twisted Neumann boundary condition for this five-dimensional theory. Right? So it's going to be more obvious when I write in terms of space. Now among these, there's a Z2 inside Z4, which is actually stable. That comes from the operation square 2 mapped into C star, I squared 12. So OK, that's the contradict the classification, because again, we're supposed to get only one homotopy infinity representation. And I'm saying, hey, this is stable. Therefore, that is another infinity representation. But that's because we forgot where we're supposed to land. We're supposed to land the category where units are C star, Z2, Z2, and so forth. And already you can put the first Z2 means replace, it can be done explicitly by replacing vector space with super vector space, Z2 being the sign. <coughs> and when you do that, do the calculation, that Z2 you add here kills the stable class. So somehow the, the symmetric braiding, the interesting braiding, the symmetric braiding on the category can be made to disappear if you extend scale as to super vector spaces, you just change your mind about what you had called odd and what you had called even. And that takes care of that sign choice. 
So it's a kind of a funny thing that to get the right answer, you really need this to vector space, a predicted answer. Much faster writing on the board. Maybe to slow you down. What did you mean by stable in this? Stable means, uh, well, in practice, this actually is a symmetric monoidal category. Okay. It's actually uh, super vector in this guys to begin with. The thing that I didn't understand is why did you want that in the first place? I didn't want that, I'm noticing that. And why I wanted it earlier. So earlier in the classification, the claim is, I'm claiming a theorem, what is a theorem? I'm claiming the theorem that, that the du this, this dual is a moduli of one-dimensional stable or infinity representations of the dual. And that seems to be contradicted by this Zemo 2 appeal. Uh -huh. Okay, I see. You're just saying that we shouldn't harm it to see crop. Map into IC star, and the Zemo 2 below is going to kill that class. It's going to make the two, two versions, the two graded categories, indistinguishable. Okay. So they disappear. Right? So, so I mean, this tiny illustration of why really IC, IC star is the thing you need, not just C star. You get, if you just insist on using C star, somewhere you're bound to get a contradiction when you do that calculation. All right, and so now I want to introduce boundary conditions. And I'd mentioned that the quantization functor can define a functor from the category of spaces with correspondences and their compositions to those d algebras and bimodules of d algebras and so forth. Now, in the TQFT, a boundary condition is an interface with a trivial theory. The trivial theory generated from a point, so a source of boundary conditions are spaces which, for, for the theory based on x are spaces which map to x, y over x. Here, by, by trivial, you allow me that? Uh, no, I, here I really want the trivial theory. I really want the trivial theory. Here. That's, that's what the boundary theory is, yeah. Otherwise, we could call it an anomalous boundary theory. Okay. So, but I, I did, said earlier that the boundary condition presentations that I want to the boundary conditions are local system of categories of the appropriate depth over x. So somewhere from here, I must be able to produce such a thing. And that thing is actually a d-1 quantization of the fiber of the map. And you convert the map to a fiber bundle, which you can do in homotopy theory, and then quantize the fiber. That's a category on which uh, the quantization of x will act, and will act by the monotomy representation via its action on y. Very natural. So if you believe this can be made factorial, that's all there is to say. So omega, the loop space, loop space of the base always acts on the fiber. Now there are two interesting extreme examples. One of them is when y is equal to x. And then you can even put a co-cycle. D minus 1. This is the space of called the Neumann condition, or the classical Neumann condition. And it's a bit counterintuitive, because you normally think of Neumann as a point, and Dirichlet as a whole space, but that's because the representation is not y, but the fiber of the map. So if you, y is x, then the fiber of the map is a point. So yes, you're acting on a point. And the other extreme condition is you choose a, a single <coughs> point in x, but actually you want the point in each component. And then the fiber is a union of the base loop space of various components with a natural act, translation action. And that's the naturally a Dirichlet condition. So Dirichlet condition is a point if x is connected and, uh, and uh, the whole space. But you see, you can have even se at the semi-classical level, you can have several Neumann conditions. And one way to, one relation with the Dirichlet Neumann condition is if you take the TQFT, put the, the Dirichlet condition on one side and any Neumann condition on the other side, you're going to get the trivial theory. So you could say maybe abstractly it defines what you mean by a Neumann boundary condition if you know what the Dirichlet condition is. Do we know what the Dirichlet condition is abstractly? So if you start from the space X, of course we do. 
But remember, quantization loses information because of all these dualities. So there isn't actually something you could call a preferred Dirichlet condition. Uh, so, the one property is that if you take the Dirichlet condition I wrote and take its endomorphism algebra over the quantization, the Dirichlet condition is just a regular module that becomes the original algebra itself. So it's Morita, but all you can say now, you can't say things are equal, you can say things are Morita equivalent. So you can discuss, say that D is a Dirichlet condition if taking the endomorphism algebra over the TQFT gives you an equivalent, an isomorphic TQFT. That allows for more, many things to be Dirichlet condition. Here's an example, not from final homotopy, it's a theorem from Austin, Kettling, and others. We stand three dimensions of the fusion category, which is indecomposable, not split as a direct sum of more than one thing. And every non-zero boundary condition or module category is a Dirichlet condition. You never lose information. The only way to lose information is to write zero as a, at the boundary. And for spaces, I just have covered this up. There's a classification of which boundary conditions generate geometrically are Dirichlet conditions. And the first condition is obvious. Uh, you have to hit all the components of X, otherwise clearly you lost the sum and in the TQFT, you're not getting it back. But you know that cannot be the only condition because of duality which flips homotopy loops around. In particular, it flips pi 0 and pi d minus 1. So there has to be a condition of pi d minus 1 as well. You could not, this would not be a valid condition on DQFTs. And the condition is that this map is actually 0. You have to think about that for more. And the example that gets you to see that exercise, look at dimension 2 and take uh, x is just bg and take the identity map, the Neumann condition in that case, and you find it's not a Dirichlet condition. You're only generating the trivial representation of the group, and you don't see the other boundary conditions, the other representations of G in that case. So that's a. Uh, um, so, yes? Is this possible to interpret this even philosophically in the cobordism hypothesis or generalized version of cobordism hypothesis? Right? Uh, that, 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 that's true for. Uh, it's dependent somewhat on the target being this iterate algebra thing, because I don't, uh, I don't know how to say that just in the source, in terms of the bodice category, I, because even, see, even this maneuver here, you take a bulk, th a bulk theory here, a boundary condition forming the endomorphism of that, I don't know how to do that in the bodice category somehow. It has to be represented somewhere, and in this representation, it's true. But, uh, Even if I take my bodisms to be decorated with these maps, I, I, I don't know how to take something like end over over something. I don't know how to do this algebraic construction internally in the body, most of the body category. Uh, I mean the. So this Even if you look at try to do final limits and co-limits in the Bodice category, sometimes often they don't exist. And when they do exist, they don't give you what you think you you are going to get I mean, after you represent them. So that's that's. So you don't want to think of these boundaries as uh, you do. I don't they, want. They, to they think are of fully local boundary conditions. Yes. So that's correct. They're functors out of uh, the Bodice category of manifolds with colored boundaries. Yes. That's correct. So that's, why that's, correct. I, that's how I want to yes. interpret. But I don't know how to define Dirichlet in the bodies category. I don't know how to make these statements like this okay. independent of the where you're representing the bodies category. The statements about the representation of the bodies category, not so much about it. But yeah, yes, they fit in the completely local notion of the bodies hypothesis. Is that statement still true for this new definition of Dirichlet? The yes. pairs with the Neumann. Uh, oh, there's no definition of Dirichlet. The definition of Dirichlet is here. Yeah, exactly. I'm asking. The Neumann that they can be defined after that. Oh. We don't define Neumann a priori. Oh, okay. So Neumann is also no longer defined. No, as oh, Neumann is defined relative to a choice of a Dirichlet condition. Okay. Then you can define yeah. Neumann condition. And maybe, is that what I'm going to explain? And, and next, no. I was going to put something else next, but maybe it's a time to. 
Uh, yeah, maybe I'll skip that for a moment. I was going to do it for a spectra and illustrate how these conditions are electromagnetically dual, but that's so nicely. Uh, let me go directly to the more interesting thing because that's going to get very to the core of what you are asking about relation with Dirichlet and Neumann. Okay. So one thing we do with TQFTs these days is quote unquote represent them on an honest QFT. I should have written this is a QFT, not a TQFT here already. So you have to think for a moment to see what that means. Well, one way of saying that is you in the examples we have, you really want to represent uh, this, well, what do you represent? You represent an algebra or something. So it has to be an algebra thing. A TQFT abstractly is not an algebra object somewhere in principle. Uh, we constructed initially a TQFT as an algebra object, QD of X, but that's if you start with the classical theory X. And as we saw, you can start with a different classical theory, a different space X, and produce an equivalent TQFT. So somehow there's information missing if you just Think of a bulk TQFT. And the information missing is basically a Dirichlet boundary, topological boundary condition on the left side. So we say that a symmetry of a theory Z is a triple or quadruple, I guess, a TQFT in one dimension higher, a topological boundary condition which would like to be Dirichlet, which makes sense in some, if the target is of some special kind, like in their categories or algebras or so on. And a quantum field theory, a boundary field theory on the right, the other side, so that the reduction you produce is isomorphic to the original QFTZ. So the symmetry acts on this. What you're writing here is a relative QFT, which is not usually said to be equal to Z. But what you want to, the way you want to think of it is, you're acting with the algebra, which is end over uh, Q of the boundary condition on Z. So end Q over C wants to, wants to be an algebra object in TQFTs. And, and if it really defines a D plus one dimension TQFT, it is exactly that. And once an algebra object it makes sense to ask for a module, let Z be a module of it, but that's how you say it. By, by the, oh, dimensional reduction, yes. So let's do it. Uh, now, if I rotate my iPad, I think the picture will still be right, maybe very quickly. Yeah. No, it didn't work. <laughs> okay. You, you reduce horizontally, so. Uh, yeah, you project on the right. I mean, like it's a movie, it's not like something falling on the floor. So here you have a D plus one dimensional theory, but it has this horizontal lines, intervals, you can collapse and you get a QFT of dimension D in that case. So for any manifolds of dimension D, D minus one or whatever, you can take the inverse images, which will have one dimension higher, and what you, you say the calculus, whatever you calculate here is what is calculated in the original theory. Just, that's what it means to project or reduce. So it's a reduction along an interval that I can draw. have been black, maybe. So, yeah. Interval, so with Q in the bulk of the interval and the boundary condition C, a topological one at one end and the QFT at the other end. And if, if, for example, we knew how to build Z as a fully local theory from starting from points, you would say you build it from this interval. Usually we won't be able to build non QFT from points, so that's just a metaphor. But so in this case, Z is just a relative theory, or Z also? Z here there is a relative theory, it's on the boundary of Q. And why didn't I hash this space or gray out? Let's see. So Q is in the solid. C is a boundary condition for Q, and Z tilde is also a boundary condition for Q, but uh, it's a, not necessarily topological. In fact, it's interesting when it's not. But 
this is a this is a theory on which you are representing a symmetry. And the symmetry really is this algebra object in QFTs, in topological QFTs. That's what we represent. An algebra object in QFTs. It's not always the case, I think if we start with topological things, that uh, this will be a well-defined TQFT, but I think in the finite homotopy situation that is the case. If both, if both uh, Q and C come from finite homotopy theories. All right. So in physics, people talk about the extended topological operators in the theory Z. And what they are, they're simply topological operators in this construction which do not touch the wall of the genuine quantum field theory. So you could have uh, things like this. Well, actually, you don't have to be smooth. It could be any defect. The topological oh, green was bad, sorry. Or you could have defects that are frozen on the boundary. And they all project to something, but the, the only thing about projection is if you start with something smooth, there's a chance it might self-intersect or stop being smooth. Not quite smooth, but defects don't have to be have smooth support, so that's not an obstruction. And there's a the sense that in some defects, may not touch the red boundary at all, be completely inside Q. Some actually, I didn't draw one, but you could have a defect that touches that and then proceeds in the interior. And some are really frozen, embedded on the boundary. So those that are embedded in the boundary may or may not be movable inside, and even if they are, there's probably more data to specify to do it. Those that are contained completely inside can always be pushed to the boundary. And they're in, in a way central uh, in the following sense that will come up uh, in probably, maybe won't come up in this lecture. Uh, will come up now. All right, so let me try to establish a translation, but I hope I got it right. What are the minus one form symmetries of Z of this? They're the self-domain walls of the theory Q. I need another color somewhere. Where are we getting that? Uh, how about... You can put self-domain walls. The projection do everything. And uh, putting a self-domain wall is in a effectively equivalent to changing your boundary condition C in this calculus. Uh, these are more recognizably symmetry, are zero-form symmetry, and those are the self-defects of C. Oh, actually, no, there is something to flag even here, and I, I wrote it down, didn't read it. Uh, we've heard a lot about half-space gauging in the easing model in Schuheng's talk. And, uh, and uh, this can be done exactly by, by, this, by this story. You can change the theory C on half. I don't have a, a pointer anymore here, do I? Oh. It's in the hands, no? You can change the theory from Dirichlet to Neumann on half the space on this side. That would be equivalent to half space gauging. The zero form symmetries are self defects. Uh, as I mentioned, all in operators in the interior may be pushed to the boundary. Um, and now it's, it becomes a bit, some interesting structure, which I think is known in the condensed matter literature a lot, but I think we, we don't understand it completely. If, uh, if you have two uh, defects, dp and dq, that link in the uh, boundary, they may actually break. In other words, there'll be a difference in computing them if you unlink them. You might get a different answer, a different number or a different vector in a state of space. That can happen precisely when the dimensions are such that they can link. But if one of them comes from the interior, then they cannot break. So that's what I meant by things coming from C are in some sense central. Because you can just take one of them in the interior and then they can move freely, it doesn't matter how. And that's a bit more general. It's true in the bulk of, uh, in the bulk or in the boundary actually. 
If one of the defects is topologically condensed, I'm hoping to get to topological condensation today. And we'll see that in the topological case, the braiding is in some sense non not just non-trivial, non-degenerate, in fact, I should have said. In a sense, uh, to make precise, Defects which have full support, they are not secretly supported on a small assembly. All right, so I think lunch is calling. Let me just see quickly where's a good place to stop. Ooh, that's a nice one. <laughs> uh, let me just I'll stop with that because I won't explain it, I'll just show it. So let me explain the beginning of the calculus of defects. And let's assume for simplicity we're looking at things that are in the bar. It's an extra complication if you're on the path. Right. So the defect first has support. The calculus works much more easily if the support is submanifold, just like the calculus of TQFTs work easily for submanifold. So submanifold has a given co-dimension. I guess I took it to be L plus oh, why is it? Ah. L plus one dimension bug dimension D plus one. So as a linking sphere. In this case, it's a null dimensional sphere. And the defects, my impression is, I could be wrong, you can tell me, my impression is that defects we're interested in physics are always local, generating from the, some data at a point on the defect. And that data kind of is co transported everywhere on the defect and integrated as if you were constructing a QFT. So you start, you need first, oh, that was a mistake. You need a, first the, Label at the point for a defect. And the local label is a boundary theory for the bulk theory, I called it Q, reduced on the linking sphere. You get an example of boundary theory by evaluating the same Q on the link on the linking ball, the disk. But if you do that, of course, it's as if the defect wasn't there, because it means you could fill, you could cover up the defect just with the usual structure and you apply the theory Q and nothing would have changed. So that's called the transparent defect. But in, for Q of SL there would be many other boundary theories and there would be. Q of SL is a D plus one minus L dimensional DQFT because you're integrated on an L map. And if Q comes from a space X, then the representation as we talked about in the appropriate level Algebras, category of algebras, of the quantization, of the mapping space. So it's not the mapping space itself. You have to understand the representations of the quantization of the mapping space. And that tells you what you could put locally a defect. OK, and then there are two things you need to be able to do. One thing is you need to be able to continue this label everywhere on the defect. And of course, the defect has topology, so there might be some inconsistency. So what happens is there's a locally constant structure in this space of defects, and you must take a constant section, a flat section of that. And the, the reason there could be a problem is because these linking spheres can rotate along the defect if it's a normal one. And even if your starting theory was oriented, for example, a theory with a dichrop wouldn't twist in that's actually uh, so invariant. Uh, all that tells you is that your orthogonal group acts on the sphere by rotation, but it doesn't tell you that it acts trivially. So it may actually act non-trivially on this quantization and on its representations. And then it's not necessarily, it's not the case that every local choice you make, or every local quantization you make, can be continued around. There'll be an obstruction to that. It's a, I, I don't think I would call it an anomaly because it's not necessarily a, a phase or a unit. Um, and the other thing uh, that's worth pointing out is that it's tricky, it gets tricky to work out when the dimension increases how the tangential structures come in. Because even once you've found your preferred defect label, you extend the defect everywhere on your, the label everywhere on the defect, you have to be able to integrate as it was a TQFT. And you know that there are sometimes conditions on the manifold to be able to integrate. It must be, you have a spin structure, a P1 must vanish, or things like that. And again, even if you start with something that looks simple like a finite homotopy type, 
if it has lots of k invariants, you can get obstructions to integrability. So that gets very tricky and is captured you know, by this diagram in our paper, which tells you what the tangential structures are that you need to put on, a, on the submanifold. <coughs> It's in the paper and I drew it in several versions on the iPad and then Dan finally found someone to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I would not try to explain that. I think it's a great place to stop because uh, I'm moving on to the classification of defects and then condensation. Explain again what you were saying there about two group cage theory and 40. So you were sort of, I think, well, maybe you should just. <laughs> I need glasses. If I, if I look here, I need glasses. If I look there, I don't. So it depends. Yeah. Yes. So you start with the two group with by one non abelian and pi 2 abelian, but G could act on A and there could be K invariance, and if you want, you can put a twist as well. And from this, you have to extract two pieces of data, and one is going to be an extension class. So, what is, what is, what is this? Why do you want that, and where do you get it from? I don't so, this is an example of the half flipping, where you flip oh, the top half of a space to the bottom. You only flip A, okay. You only flip it. You cannot flip G up. The first yeah. goes on a billion, but and even if it, if it is a billion, if you do the calculation of the closed cycles, you find you cannot flip it back depending on what the closed cycle tau prime. No, it's not the case for every tau prime there will be a matching tau. Okay, yes, that's a problem. So that requires a little calculation. I think if k is zero, the class is zero, then that's a bit easier. You don't have these arrows anyway. Mm -hmm. They just have a separate extension class and a separate class from H4 of BG because of the sign we're given. Okay. So what are you computing here? The cohomology class corresponding to I've this? I've given extension? you the extension class. That's once you agree that we don't want the quadratic forms, then the leading term in the uh, Dijkraaf Witten co-cycle is the extension class. Mm -hmm. That's what that becomes well defined, and that gives an extension class. It's better to well defined. This has to be defined. So. But this could obstruct the, the, the definition of this being a So, so how do you compute our prime here? I didn't tell you that. Okay. <laughs> I'm leaving it as a whole. <laughs> okay. But tau, tau prime will incorporate some information from here and some extension data. These groups have an extension class too, in general. So first, first uh, some information from H4 gets lost, so H4 module or something, and there's some constraint on E compatibility with K, and there's some extension data between these two groups I didn't write. And all of that is supposed to allow you to compute. <laughs> I've did this example because I've seen it come up in a discussion of charge fractionalization. I don't know what charge fractionalization is. I think it can be explained by saying that you end up with a non trivial, sometimes a non trivial extension data. So if you want to define charges from this subgroup, that doesn't quite work because, because of the extension class. You know, HX is just a torso over G. I'm not going to plan to explain this thing about tangential structure, though it's a lot of fun, but the truth is it's, especially in low dimensions, this part inside of a diagram, there's very little going on. You may have to figure out whether spin structures are required or you didn't expect, and sometimes they can. High dimensions, a lot of information. So the goal is now, well, 
I should have made a straight end first. The goal is now to comment some more on that diagram. <laughs> yes, this tells you what kind of tangential structure you will, assuming you know a tangential structure for the required for the DQFT and you understand the normal bundle, it tells you what restrictions on a normal bundle you need and the tangential structure for the defect so that you can integrate a local defect to something global. That's what, it, that's what it's supposed to teach you. And uh, so you the diagram is probably takes as long as it took to design it somehow, okay. I think. But to so integrate the defect to what? Well, you know, no, to integrate the TQFT over a uh, manifold, you need to have a matching tangential structure. You need an invariance on the object that generates the DQFT matching the structure of, a, of the tangent bundle. Absolutely. So here, you have to integrate a local defect at a point on the support of a defect. You have to integrate over its entire support. So the tangential structure on the submanifold supporting a defect must match the invariance condition that holds over the defect. And that's what this is describing in terms of the original theory, the normal bundles, and all that. That's more or less what so, so that, that, that's explained uh, carefully and painfully, I think, in the paper with Greg and Dan. But uh, yes, if, if you really want to do it in high dimension, you don't have a choice. In low dimensions, you can probably just, the question is just involves very little. <coughs> Our goal, I think, in the last time, is to understand this diagram. I don't know how to get rid of. Can I move this somewhere? Oh. I move it somewhere, I guess, but not, not completely out of the way. So there are some colors, a color scheme and some names. Is it possible to me to put it horizontal? I will, I will switch it horizontally when we actually get to explain it. I'm just saying this is the goal. I'm not going to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright. So let me start on the blackboard to explain the story. So, the story is a symmetry story, interestingly, it's a symmetry. And we have a theory about... Could you start on the other side, so we can see? <laughs> uh, I would say we can, okay, we can do that, but... Uh, <laughs> or, or you have a reason for not to, that's fine too. <laughs> uh, now we're going to try to interpret this and probably will not succeed, but we could do this, and then after I'm done with the blackboard, we would have a test. <laughs> <laughs> How many different readings of that table we can produce? It doesn't come Alright, so we have a bulk. So we have a bulk. Symmetry TFT. And that could be built from QD of some space X. So D plus 1 theory. And the Dirichlet boundary theory C, which could be the geometry for semi classical Dirichlet boundary, it could be uh, the point number to x, in other words, Q d of x as a module over itself, so it's actually qd minus 1 of x in that case as a module, as qd module of x module. So it's the same, the underlying object with one algebra structure lost. That's what d minus 1 represents, how many algebra structures you represent. Here we're viewing it as a module over itself, so we're forgetting that it had another algebra structure, remembering the action. And uh, uh, we call this you either quiche and this will be the crust. <laughs> quiche. Quiche. Yes, it started, it was a joke, but then uh, some people liked it very much because quiche is obviously quantum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard of a complaint. Uh, apparently, it should have been called it a tartine. That's right. <laughs> what? I, think, I think that was the first comment we got when we posted the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so that same day, I think. Yes. Artin is not obviously quantum. <laughs> <laughs> so and so the, the picture was you have this Q here and for some reason we do it vertically, you have the boundary here, and you have some boundary QFTZ 
which projects and reduces it to the actual QFT Z you're interested in, so B dimension QFT. And you want to say that this whole picture makes Z into a module over something, and the something, as I said before, is really the endomorphism algebra of C over Q, and that becomes an algebra object in D dimension QFTs, so it can act on another dimension QFT. This is topological, topological, and this is not. So this is a translation of Z is a module over the algebra algebra object n over q of c in dqfts in d dimension dqfts and so the symmetries are really those coming from n q of c and I mentioned that the well, so let's go back to algebra and modules. So let's say a base case, algebra as modules. The base case of Q is an algebra, and I guess I'm using A for algebra. And C is a regular module. A as a, uh, I guess, as a right module. Then what is n over q of c? It's n the morphism over a of the right module a, and that is actually a as a left module of this unitary case, with its multiplication coming from this. So saying that, you, that z is a module over this is the same as saying that z is an a module. So z is a module over this guy is the same as equivalent to z is an a. I guess that's the case with z is a t for t? Uh, Tilde. Uh, no, oh. z, z, uh, no uh, I, I didn't say that. The, the problem if z is not a tqft is that we don't know how to make it fully local. So that's why you can't use, I think there wouldn't be any problem in dimension one up to two no quantum mechanics. Right, if D is 2, that probably works exactly right, literally. But uh, higher than that, you can have problems. But aside from that, you can use this language. Um, Are you talking about Z tilde here, or is no, it really Z? Z. Z. That, that's, kind, that's kind of the point in this picture. So we're looking at actions of this on Z. Oh. Not on Z tilde. It's, 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 it's a bit confusing. Z is what you get after. Z is what you get after the reduction. Uh, and that's I see. On okay. which N Q of C is acting. Okay, that's a correct picture. So it's a bit easy to miss in this ex base example because you'd write A as an algebra, A as a module, and you have a mo another A module M, you'd write also M on the right, and the reduction would be tautological. You would say that uh, A tensor over A with M is the same M. So it looks like it's the same M you're talking about, but if you think about it in the abstract context of, of TQFTs, that doesn't work like that. So if Q, if, if in Q, instead of being an algebra, is just a category, then suddenly that picture doesn't work anymore. Right? Yeah. Question? Yes? So, so maybe, so one example is that if you put a CFT on the bun, but on the, in the bulk, it's an MTC, then you should expect a fusion channel. As, yeah, uh, as an algebra object, right? Like, would that be an example? What do you mean, right? right. right. If it's a two-dimensional... Right, two plus one. Yeah, so if, if D is two, I guess. Yeah. If D is two, so the dimension of this guy is two, and that's a, let's say it's a full rational CFT, then you can get that from the fusion category underlying... Yes, the, the picture you get, so yes, that's a non-topological example. Say uh, Z is the full WZW model. Uh, then Q is a Turai Vero theory built from the modular tensor category, it goes with that. Thank you. 
group level and this is going with let's say going with z and c is a regular boundary condition for for a driver of the just like here and the, if you want the picture that a more familiar context. Regular is Dirichlet. Regular is Dirichlet. The, the regular module, is it, is, yes. I mean, yeah. I, I, can't, I don't want to use Dirichlet when I mean something specific because I've defined Dirichlet to be something much more general. Right? As I said, any module category or fusion category is a Dirichlet boundary condition. This, I mean the regular, really mean the regular one. The same category as a module over itself. So the picture that probably might be more familiar is what's the usual picture? Here you have Chern Simons theory. Chern Simons theory in 3D. And on color chalk. Um, blue. You have chiral and the different color because it's the dual, a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic and anti-holomorphic WZW. Right? And if you reduce that to two dimensions, you get WZW. To get to this picture, you fold, the, you fold this in half. So if we put CS theory here, you have your uh, blue and yellow carol and anti halves here. And now, you project vertically first. When you project vertically first, what you get generically in the bulk is the Jern Simon theory times its dual, and that is the Turaya Viral theory based on the center. So you get here Turaya TB based on the modular tensor category. And here it takes a little calculation to see that you get a regular boundary condition. So you get C is a regular boundary condition. And here on the right, you get, I mean, these two points put together are whatever they are, the boundary theory for to write the zero theory, and the pull up and the pull up. Is it? So here, Z tilde, if you like, is an object which is a module of the fusion category, to write zero fusion category in the center. Constantine? Uh, I'm more used to uh, in the uh, unfolded case, so, but in this boundary um, picture, mm -hmm. would different uh, re uh, different module categories on the boundary produce then different CFTs? Different module categories for that, that's correct. You get different CFTs, you get different ways of combining left and right movers. That's not that's the, that's that's that one, yeah. That's, well, that's not the standard full WZW, if you don't put the regular module. This has already been exploited before, these pictures sort of were in, but I think Schweigert, uh, Runkel, maybe, and Fuchs. Fuchs, yes, thank you. I was missing a name. have studied exactly this kind of thing about assembling left movers and right movers and the connection of module categories with derived video theories and algebra objects inside various properties. So this is, you recover stuff that has already been discussed here. If you so the conditions then correspond to the special symmetry? Um, give me a second. Any module of a DMDC will give you a very fair condition is what I'm claiming. It's just there won't be so many module categories of a DMDC. It's a valid three-dimensional conformal field theory. One module category you put in. But there aren't so many of those. I think for SU2 they're completely classified. I think it's an, ADE style classification of those at various so, so 
you, you might think I have lots of model categories to play around with. I don't believe they've been classified completely for all, even for all A types, for all well, a, for a, SUN cases. So I think that is uh, that is still open. We don't have very good uh, techniques for classifying model categories or fusion categories when you move away from the group case. I'm a bit unsure if this picture still works as soon as your CFT has a boundary itself because then the full theory lives on the double which for a disk would be a two sphere and not two disjoint disks so you need to do some identification there this is also in the fuchs runkel schweiger construction so because the boundary only talks to C itself while the bulk talks to the Drinfeld center of the modular tensor category. I'm not sure I completely call that. So, I mean, you project here, right, in the center, what you get is Z, well, the Drinfeld center. Uh, no, in, in the bulk, you're getting the MTC, which, if it so happened that John Simon's theory itself was uh, to write zero, then that would, be, that would be the center of the pre center of the MTC. <laughs> That, that exists of the MDC, it's pathological. So you get the MDC here, and I'm saying if you put that just the regular module and putting something on the boundary, it means simply folding those pictures. So I mean, it's not, it's not, not doing anything. The two boundaries are not canonically identified because you start from a. Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what you had in mind. I'm always starting here. This is a fixed interval, so this you would cross through the surface. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. This is the point I wanted to make. As soon as the surface has a boundary, yeah. then you're no longer allowed to just cross with the, to make it um, a cylinder over this, but you need to identify the endpoints in a specific way. Uh, yeah, that I don't completely understand. The end, these endpoints are always completely identified. So that, that's a part of it. So all the manifolds we're looking at are the structure of something that this is. I'm not allowing to that interval to twist around or move around or I'm assuming everything is a product. And then it's, then it's consistent. The procedure is called dimensional reduction. You de define whatever it is for a manifold M to be the bigger theory on M cross the interval. And that makes sense. But then I'm confused on how it fits with the Fuchs Rung Schweiger. I, I, do, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. You're asking me how what I'm saying now fits with something in the paper that I don't know. I can't answer that. I won't even attempt. What I'm saying is this is a consistent recipe. Uh, cross any uh, one surface with boundary, with this interval, this fixed interval, once and for all, not moving anymore, you get a consistent full CFT. That's what I'm saying. And then in that, in that picture, you can also do the folding. Because it's a product, you fold the fiber this way, and then you get the fish picture. It's just a true statement. So I, I don't know what somebody else said about it. So I can't address that. Yes? So after you fold it, the bulk is CS tensor CS orientation. The bulk, the bulk is CS. So the Q is CS tensor CS dual. Right, because it's a junior center of this much. Yeah, what's going on in the background is that C tensor C. Right, exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> That's right. So that, that part, you know, the only thing I mean at the moment of thought is that when you do this folding at, at this end, you get the regular module. I mean, when the folks on the trial were looking at that, they were putting a lot of conditions on their matching left movers, right movers, and so on, including unitarity and things like that, which I haven't said a word about. I'm just saying it's a consistent QFT. That's a non-topological uh, So what's this? Uh, I, I raised it, but maybe maybe to emphasize. Because the problem is this example is too tautological, so you don't even see any need for it. But if, if you put a Q here, and you put a Z tilde here, uh, and you ask, well, what's the underlying QFT? There isn't one. Z tilde is an object in the category, whatever category of boundary theories for Q. And you ask, what's the underlying field theory for an object in that category? Well, there isn't one until you take something here and you take home over Q of C into Z tilde. And then you get an underlying 
the dimension QFT. But so without this side, the question doesn't make sense what's the underlying object. Another way to say it, if you just know this, you don't know an algebra here, you only know an algebra of Morita equivalence, and Morita equivalence changes the underlying vector space of the modules. So if you just know the algebra of Morita equivalence, it doesn't make sense to ask what's the underlying vector space for a module over the algebra. Because you keep tensing the Morita by module, depending which, which representative you choose. So what this does is spins down, if you write the representative in the Morita class, so that you can ask what's the underlying of You can ask the question before the edge. And if you change C, you do change the theory, actually. OK, but uh, coming back, I want you to Maybe say once again, what, the, what, is, what does this home mean? For my naive interpretation, I would expect C is like a left module and Z is like a right module. And um, okay, then you could write the ten. If, if, okay, if you, if you want to read it that way, then that, that, that's correct. If you want to read it as it's a left thing, as a right thing, then you write C tensor over Q. Z tilde. That. I find that it, it's even more controversial because when this is not the TQFT, I think. Tensoring these things over TQFT, so it's you know, even more controversial, but, but yes, that, that's correct. If you think of them as left and right, then you tensor. If you think of both of them as right, then ah, okay. it's a, that's a question of how you want to read the picture. Both pictures are valid because, at least on this side, C is meant to be dualizable, so I have a, a left right angles. So. This side, I have to be agnostic about with the QFT, but C could be moved from the left side to the C check, I think. So, so the C you're thinking really of as a boundary theory, yes. whereas the Z, Z tilde Z is... is also a boundary theory, not topological, though. But it's, it's, it's a full boundary theory, or is it more like a relative theory? Um, Are you distinguishing... I'm not distinguishing those two, I think so. But Why am I doing this? Because no comment. No, if yes. there exists a topological boundary condition C, yes. then the outcome of this yes. process is an absolute uh, field theory. Correct. No. So, so, like sometimes you find field theories Z tilde yes. that have no, so for which Q have no topological Correct. boundary yes. condition. And those would be like somehow intrinsically relative. In, in fact, if you take the kind of WZW, then it's a boundary condition for Charles Simons, but there is no, in general, there will be no topological thing to put on the other side. So that's why usually holomorphic WZW cannot be made into a standalone honest QFT. But you can do some things, for example, you can restrict to the G0 surfaces and then recover the vertex algebra, that sort of thing. So that makes sense. But, uh, so, so there are things you can do, but uh, you have much more than it. And of course, what you get, the Z you get, depends on what <laughs> stupid example. If you take two copies of C, the direct sum of two copies of C, you get a direct sum of two copies of the original thing. So what you actually get as the underlying full theory depends on the C again. OK, why do I do this? Because I want to get that. To explain the symmetries. Okay. So I talked about defects as being some kind of a various co-dimension as being analogous to elements in the algebra and act, acting on Z by symmetries. So I have to be careful with defects. I already mentioned there are two kinds. So there are bulk defects and defects frozen on the boundaries. So there are things you can have in here, so entirely inside Q, and things on the boundary. The things on the boundary are really the symmetries of Z, the defects of the on the boundary. Because these are really, think of them as objects or higher objects, higher morphisms, so higher morphisms. You can say higher morphisms, I don't need the quotation marks, in N Q of C. You, you might, uh, no, let, let's, leave, let's leave N Q of C. And then Q of C is the algebra which acts. 
Objects in the Markov queue which don't see the boundary C are slightly funny. They're like elements of the bigger thing Q. Now, what's the relation with that? Well, uh, if they have, so if you have a, uh, an algebra A, so algebra A, A, and you have an automorphism of A, and that's the module, that's our Q, and module M, it's the right module, I guess, in this picture, that's a C. An automorphism of A does not act on the model in general. It takes it to a different module. And if you want the, the other module on the other side, and let's pretend it was a module, that was the theory Z theory, yeah? it means don't expect automorphism of A to act on, uh, sorry, to act on the theory. But uh, there are the defects, and so you want to think of defects as sort of higher morphs, higher objects in the algebra, some embedded objects in the algebra. And then, namely, where they live, once you go in, up in co-dimension, the defects are not automorphism of the algebra, but they are automorphism of the identity function of the algebra. Of the identity function, okay? or of a higher identity function. The identity function of the identity function of A and so on. So this only makes that making sense uh, when you go category. Now, an automorphism of the identity function of A is an automorphism of every module compatible with the A module maps. So you can interpret, because of that, the embedded things inside, the positive co dimension things inside, as acting on the module. So, acting. So, uh, so automorphism of the identity of A can be represented and are represented on modules. Let's see. And that's the picture I told you about. They can project, where is your Z? Z is here, maybe. Z field is here. You project to Z, and you get some defect operator in the standalone theory Z. That's why it makes sense to think of it as an automorphism of Z. But what is the, let's look at the really. Well, there's something a bit special about this automorphism. They are, you may have seen the construction of homological algebra as the first construction of a center of an algebra object, the automorphism of the identity. So this is our central automorphism. And so an algebra has, if you like, a zero center. And that's a, acquires a second algebra structure from the contraction of A opposite with A. This is a In TQFTs, I think the TQFT and tensoring with this dual. The so one center, is what we're talking about, is uh, uh, the end of all this. And this continues. And the defects we're talking about are going to live in here, in the center of A. So what's going the center of A is some kind of doubling of A. You start with the actual doubling of A, and then you keep localizing. These are the higher centers. But in any case, it's some version of a doubling of A. So you kind of see twice as many things than you may have wanted. You might have wanted just to see objects of A. Well, the analogs of objects of A are the guys living here because they're the endomorphism of A as an A module. Whereas defects that are inside are analogs of objects of the center of A. Okay, so now we can, we can explain part of the table. When you say automorphisms of identity of A, you mean inside the two category of algebra. Right, so the two category algebra is bimodulous and intertwined. Yes, the identity functor is as automorphic. Yes. Identity functor on the category of A modules. But the identity functor doesn't depend on a fixed algebra A. So let's, let's, let's try again. Uh, yeah, the homology of A doesn't depend on the fixed more than the variant. Is that, was that what you were asking? Sorry. In, in the setting of algebra, by modules and intervinors, the 
And editing on A is just A is an AA by much. Yeah, so exactly. I think that's the one that. Oh, okay. The endomorphism of that at the center of A, if you're listening. That's the center. That's the first center, that's yeah, first center of A. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for clarifying. Okay. Exactly. And when you write two algebra there, you mean like E2 or something? or what does uh, it No, it's not E2. This is okay, it's a good point. It came up before. It's kind of oh. That's very limiting. The second multiplication of this is going to be uh, something that goes from A tensor A up to A tensor A up to A tensor A up to A by module. By module. Okay. And it's a by module A, which is going to do a contraction of the. So. Oh, let me just uh, let me just uh, say it more generally, so I don't get myself and everybody else confused. So it's, it's somehow an algebra in the two category of right. if x is an object object in C, then x tends to x check if S is a symmetric monoidal category, sorry, just a monoidal category. Then you have to be careful about right or left. It's an algebra object. Always. It's an algebra object in whatever category or higher category x was an object. The multiplication being x tensor x check tensor x tensor x check mapping to by contracting this to the identity to x tensor x checks. And now let me see if I put the check on the right side. If it's not symmetric monoidal, I probably put it on the wrong side. Uh, is it uh, on Form of x right dual tensor x into 1 equal to form of x into x. Now you move it over, you get a double right dual. So if it's not symmetric monoid, I'd have to do it here, I think. That's the multiplication, and there's a unit going the other way. Unit is from check tensor x to yeah, to x tensor x tensor, correct? And the unit goes from 1 <coughs> to x tensor x tensor. So sign this works. So in that sense, a tensor a opposite is a two algebra. It's an algebra in the category of algebras by modules uh, and. The up down is the evaluation, right? Sorry? The up down is the evaluation, right? Identity. Contraction. So evaluation, sorry, not need, sorry. That's what's better to do from slides if I checked them before. It's a great contraction of this. By the way, that's how the matrix algebra of a vector space becomes an algebra, if you think for a second. What was the other thing? You said there were two multiplications. The first multiplication, A was already an algebra object. And now, because you take x, that tensor is dual, that has a new multiplicator, new algebra structure. Uh, it's not an algebra structure given by a map, because on algebras, it's given by a morphism in the category of algebras, which is a bimodule. So the map uh, from A tensor, the dual is A op evaluation to C. There's no actual contraction of vectors here. That's going to be a bimodule, and it's just A as an A bimodule. The evaluation. So, we can distill that to something a bit vague. It's not nice, but it takes a little bit that the defects that are in, internal to Q and don't know about the boundary are twice as many as, in some sense, the symmetries of Z, because they come from the center of the algebra attack, not just from the algebra. Whereas if you force ask about defects that are living on the boundary, you're asking about endomorphism of A as an A module, and those are the elements of A, and those are the things that genuinely act when you want. And what, explain, what you probably noticed is two rows in every entry where the homotopy groups of x appear twice. OK, so what does this table mean? This is a classification of the bulk defect. I didn't write a table for the boundary defects. You'd be losing one of the rows. 
the defects of various co-dimensions sitting inside Q. So for some reason the dimension has, oh no, M is a generic number which will vary. So what did I say about defects? That if you want to know, this is the support, you want to know what can live, what kind of defect can live on the support. Well, we have a linking sphere, some S L, where this was a co-dimension. And you quantize the original quantum theory, which was Q, I think, D of X, evaluate on SL, that gives you some other kind of algebra. And the quantum label of the defect is a module for this. The label, the quantum label, and then that, that conditions and data on it, so you need to make it locally constant in the submanifold, there's a question about tangential structure. You need extra data and conditions. We actually won't need it if it so happens that the both the yellow defect and the normal bundle are framed, then you're sure that you're good. There's a kind of a constant extension of that object. That's what the quantum label thing. So if you want to find out what kind of defects of various co-dimensions are, you have to look at the qu quant quantum theory on X, evaluate on SL. What is that? Because of the way we're computing this uh, TQFT, this is a quantization of a space of maps. On <laughs> SL. Modules over this are the defect labels. You know, let's rotate things. So that's what I'm listing. Don't worry about the word condensed yet. I'll explain that a bit later. So, well, let's write the unwritten diagram here. What are maps from the sphere to X? Well, there's a vibration. By evaluation, pick a point on the sphere, you map to X, and the fiber is a base map. It's usually not a trivial vibration, but it always has a section, the constant maps. So you won't have connecting homomorphism I mean, when computing homotopy groups, there will not be connecting maps, there will be in fact a split short exact sequence. The homotopy groups of this guy up until you get to pi 1, which could cause trouble, are the sum of that plus that. So pi k of the mapping space of x to the SL is going to be pi k of x plus pi uh, k plus l. k plus l of x up until you get to k equals 1. So, so it's uh, a bit different when you have uh, but you do have to mind that by one of the base and general entire base does act on the fiber. It's not a product vibration in general. You have K variance in the space. That's a bit of twisting. All right. So you see there are two kinds right away in this mapping space as two components. There are the groups from the base. So there is the base itself, the, and this represents the constant maps. You pull back anything from the base, the constant maps. So this would be defects that somehow live on X. I'm calling the Wilson defects, I'll explain in a second why, and they're top rows in this, uh, in this diagram, in every dimension. And then there are defects which come from like uh, the base the shift of x, the base loop in x, they come, if you like, from integrating over the, uh, genuinely integrating over the sphere, the monodromy over the sphere, and those are in the second line, I'm calling them tooth defects. Why am I calling them that? Because if the dimension is three and you're looking at line operators, that's exactly what you're going to get. This would be, the pi one would be, act as Wilson lines, the pi one again would act as toothed operators. So, uh, but here, when you quantize this as a category, you get a representation of pi 1. Whereas here, pi 1 is in degree 0, when you quantize this, you just get elements of pi 1. And toothed lines for an abelian group are labeled by elements of the group. 
whereas Wilson lines are labeled by uh, representations of the group. And how does it work? Uh, so, if, uh, so if V is a representation of pi 1, right, and you look at, uh, you look at the mass space of, you're going to evaluate on some, on some M with a line defect in it, line defect, so let's just a line defect. Then you look at the space of fields, the space of maps to x. So the line goes somewhere to an element of pi 1 of x. And you have a representation of pi 1 of x in the partition function in the space of maps. When you sum over the space of maps, is weighted by that trace on the line L, on the line, the line is a map, let's call it mu, of mu star v. So you can imagine a higher categorical sense. You can actually make sense of this. You can make of sense of the monodromy of, uh, of a flat bundle of categories over a manifold of the appropriate dimension, higher categories. So you could think of adding that to the path integral. That would be a correct calculation. All right, now, why did I put some things in dark blue and some things in light blue? Well, so, okay, let's, let's read the table first. The co-dimension of defects, if it's n, so for some reason the, uh, I guess d has become n. No, n is d plus one, I suppose, right? We're in the bulk, okay. So n is the dimension of a DQFT. Then these are the point defects. The link of a point defect is n minus one sphere. And you get, you see, you get two homotopy groups. And if you remember how electromagnetic duality works, uh, pi zero and pi n minus one are kind of related in the, in the n dimensional TQFT. I mean, you could trade off a pi n minus one for a pi zero by dualizing it. And, uh, So what does a bracket mean? Did I explain that? No, I didn't explain that. This tells you in which degree you put the homotopy group. So pi zero is, the, the top row will always come from constant maps, so there's no degree shift. So the pi's are in the correct degree in the top row. And the pi's are always in a shifted degree in the bottom row, shifted. So you start with, in degree zero, you start with the dimension of the linking sphere. That dimension always shifts. Now, let's say that we were to do an electromagnetic duality on X that was moving, as I said, uh, pi n minus 1 to uh, pi 0 in X and dualizing it. Or, uh, um, there's a question in the chat. Yes. Which you see on screen? <laughs> I'm not seeing my screen, actually. Dyslectic modules over those EK algebras. Um, uh, I don't think I know what dyslectic module is. Uh, there is uh, another name, local modules. They are um, things that you can switch the left action and it doesn't matter if left or right, roughly. Defect. Well, they're higher algebras, the algebras in a higher category. There are elements, okay, let's, let me try to answer it in the way I know. Way. Okay, so if you have an there's going to be some quantization Q, I forgot what is D minus L of something of X to the uh, S L maybe, or D plus one minus L, I'm forgetting my conventions now, because it was D plus one dimension, that seems correct. This would be an algebra object in, I think, or a D minus L algebra, I think. Uh, an algebra object in D minus L minus 1 algebra, let's figure it out. 
So Q1 is an algebra in vector spaces. So it's zero algebras. D minus L lands in this higher category of D minus L minus 1 algebras. And the defect labels are in home in that category from 1, the, the unit algebra into Q D minus L of X to the S S L. And these are just modules of this in this category. Q D minus L of X to the S L algebra. I'm not immediately seeing the property you're asking about, about uh, the property you're asking about the dyslectic, I think, if I understand, is has to do with the multiplication of this coming from the fact of evaluating on the sphere. But if I had written any manifold instead of SL instead, it would still be the case that home from one to that would be modules over that algebra, but this is just the algebra structure of this is an algebra object and doesn't have to do with multiplication on M that I can think of. So I don't immediately see a yes to that question. So, yes? When you said like bracket is zero, what does that mean? Yes. I said it once, but not, uh, not, uh, didn't emphasize it enough. So the bracket, numbering bracket tells you a degree in which you need to put the group. So the top line, the groups live in their natural degree because they're a homotopy groups of the constant maps. There's no shifting involved. The bottom line, they're a homotopy groups of a base loop space and they get shifted by the dimension of the sphere. So pi zero of this mapping space is pi and minus three of x. So all the homotopy groups are groups of x, not of the mapping space. The same groups all the time for a given index, but the bottom row gets shifted in degree every time. I, maybe I don't understand, but why do you get, for example, in n equal to one line, the line, so the second mm -hmm. line, why yeah. do you get a pi n minus one from homotopy group of maps from S n minus so one? Those would come from the automorphism of line defects, if you like. The automorphism applies of the line defects, you could say, or, uh, this, of a classical labels would be this, and those would be the automorphism groups. So pi n minus 1 is, uh, is a little tricky. It's meaningful, but as I said, you can always trade a pi n minus 1 for a digraph with a twist. So you might want to imagine it's not there. In fact, why did I put this? Where does the dark blue st stop and the light blue begins? Well, it depends a bit on the parity of n. You see, that's why this is medium blue. Uh, let's say you start by doing the electromagnetic duality I told you about that flips the top half of the space to the bottom, so you have no homotopy groups above pi n minus 1 over 2 floor. Then all the blue lines disappear, and you only have this and defects up to half the dimension. <laughs> <laughs> and you begin to get the two defects uh, beyond half the dimension. Only be below here, the beginning to so I just think about all the ones before as contents. I get this condensation defects. Right, so red, yes, I think so. I didn't define condensation yet, but yes, that's what the table is supposed to tell you. Which defects are not condensed, so if you like, the bottom line of this is you can almost recover the homotopy groups of X from the quantum theory by looking at, in every dimension, a defects modular condensation, which was explained in the next in five minutes, maybe. Um, except you get them twice. You see, each of them appears twice. So pi 2 appears, well, I just missed. If I wrote the line above, pi 2 would appear again. It already appeared at the top. And it appears twice because of electromagnetic dual. It has to. The bottom half and the top half of the homotopy group have the same effect except for dualizing on the QFT. So if you look at defects internal to the QFT, you're going to get the homotopy groups twice. The way to get it once and pin them down is, there are two methods. Method one is do that electromagnetic duality to flip the top half of the groups down, and, and then you get homotopy groups appearing only once. Uh, the second method, which is uh, 
reasonable, more reasonable one from here, look at the endomorphism of the boundary condition. When you look at the endomorphism of the boundary condition, where is my vibration? But it's no longer there. Correct. Uh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> When you look at the endomorphism boundary condition, let me just draw the picture. Uh, the, you're looking at, again at the link of a defect. Let's say it's a point defect in the boundary. But what's a link now? The link now is a hemisphere yeah. with its equator on the boundary. So if this was a Dirichlet condition for x, then you'd be looking at maps from this hemisphere into x, which send the boundary to the base point. So you just get omega k of x. You lose the constant copy of x. Oops, I don't know why this is happening, sorry. So then you will get the groups only once. So you're saying that physically, the duration of boundary is not invariant on the EM duality? That's correct, that's exactly right, yes. So the difference between the semi-classical space sector and its quantization, if you just look at the quantization, is you have all the possible electromagnetic dualities that flip homotopy groups from top to bottom in the quantum field. Symmetries that do not come from symmetries of a classical space. You can freeze them in two ways. One is pick the digitally boundary condition. That's it, you're frozen. You have it. No more dualities are allowed. Only automorphisms that come from the self-maps of the space. Or get rid of a top of topic groups that are them down, and then you just have a little bit of an issue in the middle dimension. That's the only thing that's left over. That's the difference between the quantum and the classical theory. Electromagnetic dualities in the middle dimension on odd dimensional theory. Those are the only extra symmetries, and those are actually closely related to the duality defects that we've heard lots of lectures about um, in the last few days. Um, I was going to explain condensation. I have, well, okay, so we have two options. I don't think I'll explain condensation in two minutes of what we understand from it. In fact, instead of explaining condensation, I should say, did I put the name? So that started from our attempt to understand, meaning with Dan and Mike Hopkins, to understand what is being meant by that, because the term is used very literally, sometimes anonymously engaging, sometimes making things small or making them bigger. So we try to understand what math is required to talk about condensation at EQFT. And it's work in progress. I think we understand what's called one-fold condensation well. We partially understand higher-fold condensation. And to some extent, this explains that. There's no way I'd explain that in two minutes. So we have two options. Scratch condensation, and tomorrow I can talk about the easing model in, in terms of electromagnetic duality. Or I can discuss condensation tomorrow and we'll discuss the easing model. Or somebody could ask during the discussion session if you could please explain this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who could that be? <laughs> so, no, I, I was told that the discussion session is not a QA session, it's just a Q session. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know. <laughs> there are no A's. <laughs> so, anyway, so. I mean, I, I can put the, the question now because uh, then I'll know what, to, what we'll do tomorrow. Or, yes, we could discuss con that. This is condensation. Where is it? Could you say a word about why it says pi n minus 1? Pi where? On the table. Pi at the very bottom. Sorry. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I wrote this line at the beginning of the week, and I thought by the end of the week I'd be able to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but almost. I mean, what are these things? What are these space filling symmetries? That's the algebra of uh, uh, some automorphism of the theory. So you want to think of the double of the theory as an algebra at this point. So this delooping, which doesn't exist, is telling you that. So at this point, the interface, you only have x tensor x check, whereas here it's telling you to think of x tensor x check as an algebra. I think that's the, only, that's the only meaningful thing to say. But these guys aren't supposed to exist anyway. Pi minus 1 and pi n isn't supposed to be there. So I think it's, 
It's the same as before, it's a degree shift which is not correct because it's not that I can shift one copy versus the other, but you want to think of the same thing now as an algebra. The space filling defect changes the theory at this point. So you've acted with the, somehow it's with some, you replace it by something else by acting with the algebra extensor x check and putting another module on the other side. Right? That's what you did. So it's, uh, but it's actually a little tricky. Space filling defects are, uh, in fact, they're giving us trouble, we're having trouble generalizing the rule, the standard rule to this. So it, that's work in progress. This is supposed to be thought provoking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so maybe maybe I'll stop here. <laughs>
they are already putting in the labeling data onto the bordism category. Mm -hmm. And now recently there's also a sort of extended version from Kakeville, Brunner and Roggenkamp, I think. Which sort of mixes with the covertism hypothesis picture. But I'm not really sure how it's related, but there they have the same Poincare dual picture going on. But they really build it from algebraic data and not from the bordism category. Seems to be related. Probably is related, I just don't know how. What, what should we think of as the physical relevance of the SpaceX? Is this the, the sigma model, the target? Yes, the, the target of a topological sigma model. That's, that's, good. that's exactly what it is, yeah. For very simple examples, is, it, is there an explicit construction for this sandwich picture? So say I hand you a one-dimensional topological field theory, okay. aka a vector space. Is there a precise way on how I get Q, the Dirichlet boundary condition, and how I match everything together? Yeah, there, there is. The, the, the thing is, it's not as ex is it well. It depends a bit. I mean, the two dimensional TFTs, if you don't go to the derived world, they're semi simple. So the algebra of symmetries is going to be a pretty straightforward thing. But yes, the picture that was, I think maybe the original picture of this, is due to Moore and Siegel. They phrased it slightly, that was pre this hypothesis, so it said it things slightly differently. They were looking at what I call the open closed field theories. not fully local theories, and there's a slight difference in general, but not in the example they worked out very clearly. The 2D theory, they took it to be the gauge theory for a finite group G. You could add a group of components, you could change it to a groupoid if you wanted, but it would be very different. You can put a projective co-cycle if you like, H2 of B, G, C star, and they show quite, quite natural, the category of boundary condition, the things you can put on the boundary, the representation, projective representations of G. And that's a picture that's, uh, uh, you, you have of course two, if tau is zero, you have two distinguished representations, Dirichlet and Neumann, the regular representation and the trivial representation. If tau is not zero, you can only find the regular representation. And if you put here a 2D gauge theory, and uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the left boundary, I see that's a Dirichlet condition. And here you put some kind of quantum mechanics with G symmetry. So here you put some H, some quantum mechanics with G symmetry. Quantum mechanics say, with G symmetry. This, of course, picks out the underlying space of the quantum mechanical system, the underlying space. Okay, G symmetry will be a Hilbert space with G an action committing with the Hamiltonian. Whereas if you put the Neumann condition here, then you pick the invariance, invariance of space. So with, in this picture, this is a very clear picture that somehow quantum field theories of gauge symmetry live on the boundary of gauge theory in one dimension higher, and you can recover the original theory or the gauge theory or intermediate things from this uh, picture. That was the formulation of the. This is a very old picture. I'm, I must say, if you want to trace back how far back this idea of symmetries as a one-dimension larger TQFT is, I think I was an undergrad I read a beautiful paper by Witten explaining how holomorphic WCW is sitting on the boundary of Chern Simons theory, and that what he says that the yes, theory's gauge symmetry is on the boundary of pure gauge theory one dimension higher. So that's very that formulation is very old if you were asking for that. 
I think it was maybe newer than now we think of extended operators of various co dimensions as somehow higher symmetries or lower symmetries. I don't know how to, how to go anymore. <laughs> 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 Do a discussion. All right, so I think maybe, I don't know, what's the procedure? Do we take a break before a discussion session, or? You. You're in charge, I mean. <laughs> 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 <laughs>when, I think I know Dita about that, which presents very much the same idea, so I think, I think there's a solid, a solid story there. But let, let's, let's go over this, so condensation is the next topic, and in response to yesterday's comment, I've uh, dotted out the last line with pi minus one, <laughs> pending, uh, pending further understanding of those issues. Um, I, I think what I said is correct, that's an algebra object, but Condensation to the top in the examples we tried looks a bit different than condensation to uh, defect of co dimension. So I think there is, there is something to be understood there which I don't completely understand. So let's talk about condensation. As I said, that was an attempt by you know, Dan, and Mike, and myself to slowly understand what, what is needed in math to execute the procedure physicists would like to do. And uh, we identify two things, uh, two principles, if you like, or two, two notions that come in, and the clear condition on the target category. The first notion is the one I've already introduced of a Dirichlet boundary condition, but a Dirichlet condition for defects. And when you go to higher, higher fold condensation, it's actually a subtlety, but I'm not going to talk about higher fold condensation now. And the second uh, ingredient is a principle, let's say, or it's a theorem of Ostrich's for fusion categories, the correspondence between certain internal algebra object in a tensor category and model categories. And it's clear how to implement both of these in something like algebras in algebras in algebras, or categories in categories in categories, if you're in something more sophisticated or something intermediate, then it's not always clear how to, uh, how to define the Dirichlet condition. And uh, I think it seems maybe more difficult to uh, write the second correspondence. So let me do a three-dimensional example first. So actually, may maybe I should state Ostrich's theorem, because I don't think it, I said it. So. So F is going to be a fusion category. Then there is a correspondence, <coughs> the correspondence between two, two things we list, the second one we want. So on one hand, Morita equivalence class, uh, sorry, equivalence classes. simple module categories, okay? F module gaps. And Morita equivalence classes of separable or semi-simple algebras internal to F. Of separable algebras. down an algebra in a Morita equivalence class, and that's one thing. Uh, you pin down an algebra, 
if you pin down a generator of a category, so you can have the plus generator, and then you get rid of the equivalence class, how do I make a correspondence like that maybe with colors? Generator. So separable, once you say semi-simple, separable means that the multiplication map, uh, multiplication mu, mu has a section. As an AA bimodal. The correspondence is quite natural. Okay, what, what's a generator? M of M. It means that the, <coughs> the Karubi closure capital M spanned by spanned by letting objects of F act on M, so the closure of the span of F times M, where F is in a radius over F, object of F, and M is a generator, is equal to So it's the analog of a generator of a model over a ring. And the correspondence is not difficult to write, and it takes some work to prove. The correspondence to an algebra object, say A in an algebra object, um, you associate the category of uh, right A mod. Distinguished object, which is it's, it's F capital. Mm -hmm. oh, object of F capital here. Yeah. Yeah. So clearly a left module category, and it's a distinguished object which is just A as a right module, and it's an easy exercise to show it generated. A is a generator. And in the other direction, if you have a uh, a module category of a generator M, so you have capital M and little M, you take A to be the internal endomorphism object of M in F. So you take A and it's like F of M, and which means, let's see if I can get it right, you define A by saying that form from X into A inside F is equal to home inside uh, M of X times M into M. You can write more categorically, if you like, in terms of the action of in the terms of tensor functor of F to N of M and the adjoint of the matrix object N times M. But then the so the theorem is that it gives you isomorphism to sign. Uh, so what's good about this is that the definitions of the maps is extremely general. You don't need assumptions, almost any assumptions to find these maps. The assumptions come into showing that they establish a correspondence. And now, uh, and here's another theorem that's going to be used in this example. I'm sorry, but this M should be an internal N, right? N is N sub F of N, I thought that's, so that's a definition if you like. So, or redefinition. So N inside as an object of F of M. Yeah. That's what I mean by that F. Maybe I put quotation marks because 
essentially. This is the definition of A. And another theorem I want to use in the basic example of condensation is uh, always due to Ostrich or Ostrich collaboration, I think of and Nick Schich and the usual suspect, let me say EGNO. Is it the book on categories? I forgot to check the exam reference. Is that if F? Actually, for this, F didn't have to be a what's called the fusion category. So fusion, by the way, go back to fusion. This is going to be finite semi-simple with internal duals. Tensor category, tensor with internal duals, plus a condition which you don't really need most of the time, internal duals, plus uh, simple unit. And if that's not the case, people call it multi-fusion sometimes, which is, I find a bit uh, unreasonable, to be honest, because you, if you don't call it an algebra, but the unit can be written as a sum of things, you don't call it a multi-ring, you still call it a ring, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, uh, so multi-fusion, so if you drop this, people usually call multi-fusion. But the distinction is immaterial because maybe I write a proposition. So before this, oh, there's no before this. Uh, let's write it here. You can see the proposition. Every multi-fusion category is Morita equivalent, categorically Morita equivalent. So their TQFTs are the same, it's a short way of saying it, to a direct sum of fusion categories. We have the same Morita equivalent because you could take a matrix algebra on vector spaces and the unit is not simple then. Okay, all right. So theorem, if F is fusion, or actually if there's only one sum and here is the condition, if F is fusion, in the composable is good enough. Then the center of F is Morita equivalent as a fusion category. So Morita as fusion category with F tends to the opposite. a very strong statement because moreover you know Z of F is not just a tensor category but a braided tensor category which means a second multiplication on it and lo and behold a second multiplication on this because it's of the form X times dual of X and the second multiplication to match. I don't think we need that. Isomorphic as algebra objects in the three category of fusion categories, if you like that. Uh, okay, I can say one more thing. How do you realize the equivalence with a bimodule category and it's an obvious one, namely F itself? The more the object. It's an object of the form x times x dual. It's an algebra object because of that. So they're both algebra objects in fusion categories, three categories, categories, and they're isomorphic as algebra objects. That's a good way to say it. Okay, so, and uh, 
à cause de ça. So let's see some, some correspondence. So an example of the equivalent. The Morita equivalent, in particular, module categories over the two sides must match. So in particular, uh, so that's an example, not for this, but in the previous thing. So example, G, let's take the F as Z of, is that the one I want? No. F as F tensor F mob module. This is a transparent interface, the three dimensional theory. to the regular module for z of f, uh, but let, let's, let's check it. It's z of f tensor over f tensor f monoidal opposite with, hmm, sorry, I'm doing it from memory and misremembering, I think. Um, The Morita equivalent, sorry. You have to use the Morita yeah. bimodule. Okay. Yeah. Response to F as a Morita bimodule, then tensor over F tensor F monoidal opposite with F. So maybe I use a color distinguishing the Fs. Okay, so that's a calculation. And that is a computation of the center. We're going to object that's actually the co-center, so in fact. Depending if you go left or right, you might have to twist the bimodal. So let's say caution. Usually, this is the same as the center. This, this is defined as, as n over f f more. Center and co-center differ. All right. Um, are we going to need uh, some? Yes. Uh, so this becomes a regular module. So this is now a regular module for zero of f. For z of f. And what algebra object defines a regular module? Just the unit in the category. So this. So you need the category. <coughs> defines, defines. Sorry, what did you mean with caution if not, not pivotal? Uh, yeah, this, is, this two are not isomorphic if, if for a general fusion category. You have, sorry to be, you have a center and the co-center, and they go the two framings of this, uh, two ah, three framings of the circle. And one is end, and the other is tensor. Okay, so, so I said that the tensor was the center that requires that. So I could say the co-center, but then the next thing wouldn't be correct in general. So something, uh, it's not that important, but uh, if. Uh, we replace pivotality by quasi pivotality that we saw in the so Ivet talk. Would you can explain to me quasi pivotality. Well, yeah, like that the pivotal structure is uh, exists up to a conjugation by uh, by invertible objects. Oh, 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 oh. I see what you mean. Uh, does it ever happen actually that that, that thing is not one in the, over the complex semi-simple rings? There, there are some generalizations like that don't actually come up. I don't know if this is one of them. But maybe let's... Uh, 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 
I think this will be correct if you replace f by the dual as an ff by module. Then this is the center, otherwise just a cosenter. So have to worry about that. But uh, it's not important. I would assume yes, but uh, it's possible. But. Uh, I mean, isn't it, isn't it just a question about like having an SO2 fixed point and positive pivotal is just, is, doesn't, is, just pip, is, is what, like if you look at the SO2 action, I think then you get quasi pivotal and pivotal is just a special case of quasi pivotal. Pivotal is special pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that, that, that I believe. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no just, just being, <laughs> I just mean that, uh, like being an SO2 fixed point is already quasi pivotal. So and I think this is an. Um, no, I, I see what I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. SO2 is all that's needed, I think, for this, yeah. All right, um, I'm kind of losing my, my train of thought. Oh, yes, I was going to do the example of condensation. OK. Um, I think that's all the background for fusion categories. And now. The category is the unit? Sorry? Uh, you said for a regular module, it's the unit in the category, the unit in F or in Z of F? Unit in Z of F here. So this is a mo regular module for Z of F. For any, for any fusion category, uh, if you take the regular module and take one as uh, the generator, that corresponds to the algebra object one. Uh, if you take some other object as a generator, then you get the ma essentially a matrix algebra over that object, M tensor M check, I think, so, which is more equivalent to one. That's what, that's what happens if you change generators. And I said nothing interesting happens if you change generators. Um, all right. So. So I, as I said yesterday, I don't have to write it down to repeat today. What we got a precise wish list from some physics colleagues, and Thomas Dumitrescu is one who explained it to us best. But it's just a standard thing that's being used in the literature. You want to say that from a, in some cases, if you have a maybe I do it in the board. If you have a defect of a certain co-dimension, and just to think of, of drawing transverse slice and really reduce it to a point, so there's a linking sphere here. And sometimes you can join them together to get a defect of one dimension higher, one whole dimension lower, with some structure. And conversely, you can then rip this one open and do my topological manipulations to pass things through. Those are the requirements. So clearly, to rip something open, you have to have an end. So you don't just have so at least what you have. And I think the starting point for the good definition is what you have really is a, already a, a condensed, the, con, con, the condensate together with its ends. Not to have the condensate with the ends. <coughs> When you make it very, very small, like, of course, it means nothing in topology, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> when you make it very, very small, you have a defect that's lower dimensional, looks like a point. So this is a, a co-dimension L, maybe, and this has co-dimensions. This is a condenser, if you like. I don't know what to call it. That's co-dimension L plus one. And as I mentioned quickly yesterday, because you have these ends, you have a, there's some issue about framings to, that I won't address. You have an algebra operation on these guys. So this is, this is an algebra object. So that's a kind of thing you'd like to say. That you, you have an algebra object and called local higher co-dimensional defects, you can condense it, one full condensation to create a higher dimensional defect, and then let's check it, let's check what happens in this case, the fusion case, and then let's spell out the conditions that one really wants to impose. So uh, so a fusion case, a fusion case, and it works the same way actually in the Rashid Dick Interaif case. It's the Rashid Bureau case, and also works the same argument work in IP. First of all, uh, the only condensed line defects are just multiples of a transparent defect, so no interesting, so only transparent <coughs> line defects. And uh, uh, all surface defects are condensed. So let's check that. There, there 
reduce the theorems on that side. Okay, so let's draw the picture of, of uh, so the first statement is kind of trivial, right? So did I actually write this? Maybe I wrote it on. Yeah, it's actually written here, so I can switch to the iPad. It could take a long time. All right, so one, the first statement is pretty obvious because there's nothing too interesting to condense from in the fusion category. The point defects are just uh, multiples of the, if you look at, all right. Should I do it? I think I have a point, the thing is a two-sphere, and when you evaluate a two-sphere, you just get C, so there's nothing interesting to condense from. An interesting algebra. There's, there's multiples of, the matrix algebras, of course, but then uh, just the multiples of a transparent defect. Um, so let's go to surface operators. All right. So what does the surface look like? Okay. So here's the the green things are lines. The dimension is correct here, and there's like a surface connecting them. Okay. What's the uh, what's the link for a surface? What classifies surface defects? The link is S naught. So that's F tensor F monoidal opposite. So that would a module over this would label a surface defect. Right? Um, what would label an end of a surface defect? Actually, I didn't write it, and I cannot write it there. I have to write it here. Yeah. So, end, I didn't, so I didn't say what the end was. Well, it's a map from, so, uh, from the transparent surface defect to it's an interface with a transparent defect, as you can see, there's nothing on the other side. So this is by module map from, uh, from uh, F to the end. And there'll be in the other direction you have to dualize, and there you have to start being careful about framing, so it's already coming up. So that's the data for the surface defects with ends. Okay, what's the data for line defects? Well, and how would you get the line defect if, if you use this procedure? Well, you would make this strip narrower and narrower and, and surround it with a circle. The circle gives you the center, so you get an object in the center. So uh, line defects are objects in the center. So now we're looking for algebra objects in Z of F, and we're trying to relate the two sides. But now algebra objects in Z of F are the same thing a Z of F module to the generator. And let's move this. So now you can't get rid of this. Ah, OK. Algebra objects to the generator. And algebra objects for Z of F, a generator is a, sorry, algebra objects are modules to the generators. A generator being a map from the, from the regular, from the, regular module to M, but module categories over, where is my pointer, sorry. <coughs> so module categories over Z of F are the same as F times F by module categories. So data are in perfect bijection in this case. When would that fail? Let's, let's change it to a place that fails. Well, this fails if F is a multi-fusion category. Uh, no, this doesn't fail. This fails. This equivalent to the center fails when it's a multi-fusion category. And why is that? Well, you can just imagine F is vec, the vec sum of copies of vec, not fusion anymore. Then this is essentially a, like a square of copies of vec, and the center only sees a diagonal of that square. So you cannot relate different sum ends anymore. So we lost that information. And in that case, indeed, there are interfaces that cannot come from lines because the interface can mix different sum ends in F. And that can happen for an endable defect because on the other side, when you go, you don't mix a different sum end. So that's ruled out. So, so it's, a really, it's a really good test. And now we see that this equivalence really is a form of connectivity you want to see on F. F is connected if it's fusion, and not if it's multi-fusion. <coughs> All right. So I think, is that the questions about this? I think this is a... 
Uh, one, yes. one remark. <laughs> it's possible that uh, in, in the physics literature we call the condenser uh -huh. the condensate of the thing that you call the condensate. <laughs> okay, which one do you call the condenser, which one do you call the condensate? <laughs> Right. Because also, you can also make up other things, condensate and condensator. <laughs> no, because, because uh, so, so the idea is that like, the, the, the thing that you call condensate mm -hmm. is the algebra object uh -huh. that, we are, that, that you are gauging along the condenser, no? Okay, I don't, I don't understand in terms of gauging. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Condensate is... You are, in, you, are, you are inserting a mesh of the condensate uh, inside the condenser, is that true? No, I think I, I, I would say that when you go from this to that, I would say the, the answer is the condensate, and this is the condensate. That would be my intuitive picture. You say the top one is the condensate. Condense, so I, I would say this is the condenser. The, the point is the condenser. Uh -huh. I would say that, and this is the, con the result is the condensate. Okay. Like I think okay. The, the suffix A to me suggests the result of doing something. And er is some action, I, I would, something that acts. Okay. That, that's what I would say, but it's, I mean, it's entirely possible that in literature it's... No, 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 then, then, then I haven't understood. <laughs> what? <laughs> then I just haven't understood. It's all right. <laughs> so it's, it's this object, which is very small, has some additional virtues, like power lifting, it's an algebra. <laughs> And that, those additional virtues allow it to clump together, to condense to a condensate. And that, that seems to me like a uh, SAT, a comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's possible, as I said, that I got got it backwards. So I I, I I don't know what the standard terminology is. So I just I'm just pointing out uh, the other words. If you raise condenser and condenser, everything else in the drawing is uncontroversial. So, but the, the surface part is given by a. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, what happens after? Okay. Oh, I got kicked out and I'm coming back. Oh, interesting. The condensate is an algebra object, A, in the center. The condensate is an, the, co oh. I, I said condensate twice here. Oh, sorry. That's what the... Uh, that's, that's confusing everybody. Yes. Oh, sorry. Now I said it. Sorry. 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 The condensate... What am I doing here? I'm going backwards. The end of condensate is correct. This is the co how, how, yeah, how, thank you, I wrote it backwards. I, really, I meant to say that this is the con wrong count. That's the condensate. Condensate, yeah, sorry about that. I have okay. it backwards. It's condensate. Yeah. Uh, that's why, why I was saying that sorry you got it. That. Yeah. <laughs> I got I don't know what that. And this is the condensate. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. All right. Yes. And on the left, the end, it's the end of... The end of the condensate. The condensate has to come with an end somehow. It's part of, part of the structure to give an end to that. But the condenser is an algebra object just in Z of F. In Z of F. It should actually come with a, with a, with a module, but it's, it's always a regular module. And that's, if you do the correspondence both ways, that's what you always get. You could have to be... You, you could start with A and uh, another, uh, the algebra, no, 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 so if you start with A, you get the module category uh, and uh, uh, 
that matches exactly. Once you have the algebra object, you really have produced the bimodal category with the generator, and that gives you the condensate and its end. So there's a lot of freedom to play with. The left of the yellow, the big thing is a condensate. Yes. That's a module category. And the end of the condensate is a, in, is a interface, I guess, between the transparent interface and the surface defect. Transparent defect. And surface. The, the black thing that goes through? The black thing that goes through is supposed to indicate the link, although it's a bit inconsistent. There's the black and the disk, but then you wouldn't see anything. Yes. That's, that's a normal bundle, and this is the link, so maybe. Hashtag, hashtag. Uh, let's see. Can I do something? Ooh, let's see. Ooh. Do my artistry here. Style. Let's make this gray. That is gray. And now we can do something. else. can we do here? Uh, this and make it gray as well. Okay. It's a more consistent picture now, I think, right? The normal disk is gray, the link is black. All right. Okay, so now what follows, actually, it looks like uh, I might fill up more time than I wanted. What follows is trying to stay in the abstract context, to stay what we did here to set things up so you can state the conditions you want to hold. And it's like the, I don't know, it's a math equivalent of a tongue twister, I find. <laughs> but it can be done. <coughs> so, the first thing, there's an isomorphism of, it, we know that, that's the first statement, the first line, this, uh, what's my pointer again? It's true in any TQFT. And you observe that home from one to the theory applied to the sphere has an algebra structure for multiplication of spheres. And by, that, by the adjunction between, so you have the trivial theory, you have whatever you compute on the sphere, and you have the disk mapping the trivial theory to T of the sphere. And for the, for the pair of pans multiplication on spheres, this is a unit. And this is a, you have to, I think right the word is exactly correct here. If you're below the top dimension, you always want to f f use the um, bounding framing on the sphere. Below the top dimension means you can fill the sphere with a ball that has a standard framing. That, that allows you to give the algebra structure to write a unit. And then it's the formal adjunction, which tells you that this algebra on the left with the algebra structure on the sphere is the same as an end in one step down, the endomorphism algebra of this object between one and T of S. I've just rewritten it as a composition this way. And omega L, the L looping of the category C, C is a target category. I could have, should have said that. Oops. It's just simply iterate endomorphism of the unit object, L times. That's what, so that's what omega, the omega Ls say here. All right, so that's a formal statement. Nothing has been assumed here about the QFT. Okay. And now we want to introduce two principles that allow us to state condensation. The first is Austric principle, let's say, which is that algebra objects inside the left-hand side correspond to module over the right side. And these two are the same thing, but they, somehow this, this formulation spells out the, the algebra object more clearly, more evident. So all, the, all this adjunction done is spell out more clearly what the al algebra object structures on the left. So as algebra object internal to the left should be module categories over the left or module categories over the right, with a generator. And the second one is, without that, I don't know how to state the Dirichlet condition. This is a localization assumption, which says that object in, let's look at the left side. How oh, do I get rid of this? It's 
I can. I really can. That oh, uh, that object on well, almost the left side. For some reason, I changed L. Uh, Objects in here, so the cat home category. In this home category, is a distinguished object T of the disk, and the condition is that objects are determined by their localization at this object, or better say, localization at this object is an equivalent. So, what's localization? You take an object in there and you replace it with home from the object T of DL plus 1 into M, that's obviously a module over end of T DL plus 1. So may maybe it helps to write something lower down because it's very... It's the notion we're trying to write is the generator of a category. generator of a category G of a category C means that the functor from uh, an object X in C to home from G to X in, in end of G modules is faithful. That's how we write it here. You can detect when two morphisms from between X and Y agree by just checking it on G. That's a very useful notion. Now, unfortunately, in a homotopical setting, I don't know how to state faithful. You might want a good notion of faithful because injective surjectives don't have meanings anymore. Uh, the only thing I know is a homotopy equivalence. So I think that the only, right now, the only condition we can think of doing is asking that this functor, which takes an object, the localization at T of the disk, is an equivalent. So let's, let's back up a bit. So T of SL is an algebra, and the, where is the module? The object T of DL plus one is a, represents the unit for that algebra, which is the algebra as a module over itself. So in that case, if the category is a category of modules over this, then you're saying nothing. Because you're saying that for the category of A modules, A is a generator, and that becomes completely tautological. Because you're taking a a module to M to the A module M. So in that setting, where you're doing algebras and modules, this is not really an assumption. But without that, I don't know how to say the I want to state the condition. Okay, and now the, let's say, repetition of what happened earlier is simply, you start with your condensate M, uh, together with an end, the condensate. You localize the condensate. You get a module over something you cannot see. A module over the n home of 1 L to T of SL, that was the assumption, plus the generator. And that end guy, that, so okay. Now the Austric principle. Can you take the bar away? Uh, to the top, maybe? There's no, to the top. Yes. Yeah, right. right. So the Austric principle tells you that from here you get an algebra object inside and the regular module going with it parenthetically. That's all right, so overall, you start with a condensate at an end, and you get an algebra object in the space of the <coughs> for defects of dimension one lower. And you have, you have to impose a Dirichlet condition on the end, is that when you condense back, you get the original defect. That's more or less what it says. If, for example, the original M had, uh, was direct sum of two things, and your end was zero on one sum end, Obviously, you run through this, and you then go back, you're going to lose the sum, and that's zero. So that's why you can impose a Dirichlet condition. So what we wrote before the nonsense is the, the, a condition we have to ask so that we can impose the Dirichlet condition. But I think that's uh, something which in higher categories require further thought, because as you see here, generator is a weaker condition than saying that the category is equivalent to the modulus of the sum ring. But the higher version of it. Sort of nice, that's the comment on that. So 
for Bostwick's theorem, there's a two category conversion, which asserts that the two category of separable algebras, bimodules and bimodule um, morphisms, is equivalent to the two category of module categories, module functors and module natural transformations, and there you don't need to use this choice of a generator. Uh, you, if you don't put a so generator, you're going to get something a Morita equivalent. That's correspond. The, the red things correspond exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can kill this part. Yeah, you can kill this part if you want. But actually, in this case, I think you don't want, as you, cause, as you can see, we want we want the condensate and an end. So it does come with a generator, basically. Mm -hmm. and you need that structure. So if, if you change the n, you're probably going to get a different algebra object down there. Delta there is what you call it A before? Uh, delta, what I was calling A. Why would I call it delta? Uh, for no reason. Will this choice matter in the end if you choose a different generator? So, if you choose a different algebra object in, in the start, then you're going to get a different module category. So the condensate. Elementary equivalences. Uh, sorry, a stupid question about this. Uh, is, are you somehow saying that if I would, for example, gauge a finite group and look at the group algebra, then you're somehow saying that? the gauging procedure doesn't just depend on the Morita class of this group algebra? Or am I understanding yeah, I, 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 I don't, I'm not, okay, can we restate this without mixing gauging and condensation because I don't understand how those two are equivalent. So I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they're not, I just don't understand how they do. So we have to rephrase the question without, if possible, without that. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand. Can I ask you? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you want to reform my I cannot. <laughs> Don't understand it. You say whenever you have a condensate, so a, a thing that you can end and you can split into condensers, there is an underlying algebra object. There is an underlying algebra object. That's the same. So, so the idea is that whenever I have in my theory a thing that behaves like a condensate, uh, a condensate then there is associated to that an underlying algebra object. One, one dimension, one dimension yes. lower. and you can think of the algebra object is make it very short and put the end. It's one, yes. one dimension lower, yes. no? Like uh, it's one dimension lower or one co-dimension cool higher, of course. Yes. Yes. So, so the size of the sphere is, is the co-dimension. The size of the sphere is a co-dimension, so yes, it goes up. Yes, you start here. So this, is you a, the high. This, this, this difference in dimension is the, is the one fold. That's a one fold condensation. Yeah. Yeah. And there's an obvious guess now you can soup it up by saying, uh, well, let's look at E2 algebra objects or E3 algebra objects three steps down. That's an obvious guess you can write, but then there, we, we had some surprises when doing examples that, yes, if, if semi simple examples we can compute. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. You need to add information, you need to add impurities on the boundaries before you can condense. So if you can condense clean boundaries, the dimension is higher. So that's, we, we don't know if there's some canonical information you can put in, or you just have to well, use whatever you can, that's, that's that. that. That's why I'm not going to say more about higher fault condensation. Okay, actually I'm out of time and for anomalies, but what did I, on this, oh yes, so with, let's say very mild assumptions on, do we need this stuff? With very mild assumptions on uh, Karobi completeness, and with these definitions, assuming when the, those princi ostrich principle and everything holds, one can prove the ripping open theorem, which is if you condense a defect to the top, you can punch a hole, which once you have a hole, you can make it as large as you want, which means you can retract the top cell to something of lower dimension. 
and produce the same state in Hilbert space, provided you add uh, the same impurities on the boundary. If you just write the clean green boundary, you may not be able to produce the same state, but if you start adding embedding defects, you will. So that's what happens. And uh, presumably, this for higher fold condensation, you can keep interacting the dimension even more. And in topology, that's a known theorem, so maybe I have to end with that and not talk about anomalies. Uh, so if, if, so if x is, is k connected, k connected, which means no pi less equal to k, and n is a, let's say, n manifold, then a map <coughs> from n to x can be retracted on a subset of codimension of what is it? Uh, codimension k. Maps are k fold condensed. Or k plus one fold condensed. So I'm losing track of my of my k. I think k plus one fold condensed. So first homotopy group is the first homotopy group. labels and defects of various co-dimensions. So when you in, always when you integrate the labels to produce a defect of a sub-manifold, everything except the red stuff is, can be supported on smaller parts of the defect. It's not intrinsically supported on the entire defect. But there's of course no canonical way to choose a support, a smaller support. That's a choice. So I think that explains, so some years ago in some physics papers, Based on simple examples, people are computing fusions of defects and they wanted to incorporate defects of higher co-dimensions and they're writing, they're finding examples where you could write that uh, a composition or product of two defects of a given co-dimension includes defects of higher co-dimensions. So there's no coherent algebra that allows you to say that in general, but what I was expressing is that there is a when you multiply, when you compose defects, there is a main part supporting the entire submanifold, but there are also condensed components which you can shrink onto a smaller thing and express in terms of defects of, uh, of higher co-dimension. But there's no, simply no canonical procedure to do that step. That's all. But uh, all right, that's, I'll stop here, I think. <laughs> Stop sharing. So, oh, maybe I shouldn't have stopped, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned just very briefly what happens with the higher fold situation? Yes. Like uh, yeah, uh, here's uh, well, I don't think I want to explain it because I, the, the short answer I don't know, but the obvious statement doesn't work in full generality. Okay. Uh, what happens is that's an exercise one can do. Uh, so I've defined the notion of a Dirichlet boundary condition for uh, DPFT. Now you can think of doing dimensional reduction, and what happens, a Dirichlet condition does not necessarily reduce to a Dirichlet boundary, to a generating boundary condition. That property is not preserved by dimensional reduction. And that, that's why with higher fold condensation, it may not be enough to use the clean, just the original clean boundary. You might have to in, insert defects inside the boundary to be able to create generating boundary. So that happens when in three-dimensional gauge wave, a finite group, you can find examples. And, uh, when we use a longer circle, we don't get the initial condition. 
generate maybe only a trigger representative or something like that. So that, that's, that's uh, the problem. And the picture that we think is correct in general actually is not, ends up not being very different from people writing physics and ignore that. And it's, oh yeah, fill it up. So we may want to start with the, the lattice of the two fold condensable defects and just put the, the way that you put the condensate on small balls around the points and with a boundary at first with a clean boundary around it and then the claim is that you should always be able to find some embedded defects, embeddable defects here to allow you to attach handles to generate this guy now this stage only this is back here um, if, you, uh, if you had a fine knot problem, uh, this would be able to be filled, you need to put another defect there. Uh, but no, actually, no, in two dimensions, that's all that happens, so this you can fill. Um, in three dimensions, the tendency of the sphere, you would have to put some kind of uh, defects like that, and uh, I'm running out of colors. and additional defects there, and those will allow you to attach handles by an easy dimension. That's how it's supposed to do. It's supposed to mirror building up things by attaching handles, but in examples, it seems like attaching handles may require you to add embedded defects before you can actually do it. That's, that's the only thing. That. So again, I, we don't know if there's a systematic way to specify that, or that's uh, uh, or if you just do what you can somehow. In the example of the Rai Viral theory, for example, there is a systematic recipe for filling complete space. So that, I mean, it's possible that with the right definition of semi simplicity, there will always be a systematic procedure, but we haven't incorporated semi simplicity in this so, yeah. There is a, a concept of Heiger anomalies, yeah. which are somehow yeah. obstructions to, to, to perhaps certain types of condensates for given, yeah. associated to certain algebra objects. Yeah. In a sense, like, it re resonates with the, what you just said, mm -hmm. that like, if you, if you, if you w w once you start feeling higher and higher dimensional yeah. things, there are conditions that appear. Do you see obstructions? Or, uh, or is there a... Uh, y y well, there are obstructions, because if, if, if the initial algebra is not commutative enough, there isn't realistic chance to feel a, a condense it many times over somehow. Uh, the intuition, I, which I think is correct, and you know it probably is for every dimension of condensation, you need an extra algebra structure somehow. So that, that's, that's all right. Now, uh, obstructions to finding... Uh, uh, to finding uh, Sometimes there is something that you, you can condense in a given dimensionality, yeah. uh, in, but if you try to, to go higher, you cannot. Let me understand what you mean by higher. Right, because higher could mean two things. Higher could mean going up in dimension and uh, lowering the categorical level. So, I think smaller the difference between condensing this, in one, you can think of it as a one dimensional condensation, you can also think of this, then it, yes. if you go up in dimension that way as a two dimensional condensation. Yes. yes. So, is that what you meant by higher, or did you mean, or did you mean, or higher? You could still think of it as a unidirectional yes, condensation. That's what, I, that's what I meant by higher. The, the, the first. The ah, I see. The, this thing. <coughs> Don't know if the obstruction, but that could be. Uh, it might be a statement I said that the reduction has to be the opposite. No, uh, that is what it's saying. I think that the dimensional reduction means crossing with a. Mm -hmm. The first step is crossing with a line of a Dirichlet condition may not be Dirichlet. Might be exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's possible. We just haven't seen enough higher dimensional examples beyond the draw network and we'll fill it up, which leads to the golf ball and soccer ball questions. All right. Oh, bad.